rising like a lion from the ashes, passing over in an upper room, back from the grave like Lazarus, endless like the great pit of Carcoon. I'm talking born again, man, like born again, the dared overrun by Frank Miller, cause the bird's flying high, my friend. He beat his would be killers, come on now. Bird is back, all you bird loving loonies, he's looking to end your woes. Jonathan Livingston sales goal wants to take you to all the Smod Co. shows, man. Wants to help you laugh, that's all. The bird won't steer you wrong. He's Jonathan Livingston sales goal, bitches, and this here is his song. He sings of Christmas wishes, of gifts of gab to share. Use them to give the gift to Smod Co. shows, man. Don't be giving socks and underwear. Shit. Zombie? Nah, he ain't no dead alive. He laid low just so that he could survive. But now he wants to fucking fly because the bird of sales and ships are number one guy. Oh, the bird of sales and ships flying again, children. Look up! Flying in the face of conventional wisdom. But this bird ain't no dodo. Oh, he was mistaken for a turkey in an unfortunate gun mishap earlier this month. And there was that whole thing where he was almost included in a turducken combo box meal, man. But he's free now. Bird's back, bitches. He ain't taking no for an answer. He wants to take you to Smodco show. That's right. Tell him, Jonathan Livingston Sales. Go, ha, ha. This is way of saying, oh, you've missed so much of my absence. Smodco shows make the bird go, man. And here's some that you can come attend very, very soon. Hey, Thursday. This is very fucking Thursday. I'm going to be in Toronto uh, with Dean Blundell for Christmas Fest, man. Got the Dirty Heads playing there. Craig Gass going to be there. The Salads. Uh, oh, it's going to be a good time. Thursday, December 13th at the Sound Academy, man. Tickets through csmod.com. Uh, after that, December 15th, December 22nd, me and Ralph going to be uh, at home, man, where we always are. The John Lovitz Podcast Theater, man, where we constantly do that show of ours, a little show called Hollywood Babylon, Bird. That's right, round two of the song. Fuck y'all. It's been a long time since me and the bird hung out. And as you can tell, the bird's very, very happy to be, be with me. Listen to this. It's joy. Yeah, man, granted, he always sounds like that, but still. I can understand the bird the way that Han understands Chewy. Even though Chewy seems to say the same thing over and over again, I can differentiate like Han. Everything. Right there, the bird was just like, I appreciate life more than I ever did before I got shot. I'm going to get a lot more ahead. Bird visited a dark place. And uh, what he came back with, he just could not stop talking about head and how there's no head on the other side. It's crazy. He saw a tunnel of light and there was no head there. I don't know. In any event, back to the schedule, man. Uh, December 22nd, big day of the John Lovitz Comedy Club, man, and podcast theater. Me and Ralph doing Hollywood Babylon at 8 o'clock, but uh, me and Jason Muse are doing our 100th episode of Jay and Silly Bob Get Old, man. Uh, this one is our holiday special, 100th episode, and also all the proceeds we're going to make from that show we're going to give to uh, the New Jersey Hurricane Sandy Relief Fund that uh, the governor's wife set up out there. So... Uh, that's December 22nd, man. It's a twofer. Uh, you know, not twofer. It's two separate tickets. But two different shows on that night. See me and Ralph at 8 o'clock. See me and Jay Muse at 10 o'clock. And then December 31st, man. Don't forget, it's our third annual Hollywood Babylon New Year's Babelieve, man. December 31st. Uh, show starts at 10 o'clock. Me and Ralph ringing in the new year, man, until our balls fucking drop and whatnot. And then in the new year, folks... Smorgy. Oh, it's going to be hot, man. What's Smorgy you're asking? January 26th and 27th in Halifax, Nova Scotia. That's my answer. Probably doesn't answer your question what it is. It's a pod palooza type event, man. A weekend full of Smodco podcast shows. What shows, you ask? Oh, shit, man. I knew you were going to ask, and I knew I could tell you. Even though the song's ending, man. We loop it back, and I tell you what shows. 
Smod Coast Morning Show. Bird loves that. I sell comics. Highlands of people history. Yeah, this is true, Bird. It won awards. Um, Smodcast, a Secret Stash, and Babylon. That's right. What a hell of a first day. And then on Sunday, the next day, you got Fat Man on Batman, uh, Babylon Comic Con Theater, plus one, Tell Him Steve Dave, Jay and Silly Bob Get Old, and then a big old smash-up show to end it all up. It's at the Spats Theater, man. One time, one weekend only. The Smorgy, Smodco Smorgy, man. Smonsters of talk. All sitting around for two days long. Just get intimate with us. That's a great space, man. Spats is not massive you're almost like right there on stage with everybody it's pretty sweet so there you go man that's what's going on uh, in the Smodco show world meantime what podcasts are dropping this week well uh hollywood babylon uh we ralph had off we didn't do a show this weekend but we did manage to do a a babylon hollywood babylon giant sized annual number one uh entitled clerks three audience zero uh, it's basically this two-hour extravaganza that we recorded at home. Me and, and Ralph and a special guest, Scott Mosier. And uh, it's all about uh, the Clerks 3 news that dropped fairly recently. So there's that new podcast. There's a brand new podcast, which is, uh, you, thank God you're going to hear Scott Mosier over on Hollywood Babylon for two hours because you're not going to hear him on podcast this week. It's the Way Brothers again. Everyone loved last week's uh, episode with... Gerard Way and Mikey Way from My Chemical Romance. They're back this week uh, as we continue going deeper and deeper into that song I love, uh, uh, the Welcome to the Black Parade. It's a, it's fantastic stuff. Go listen to it. Uh, there will be a new Fat Man on Batman dropping this week, of course, um, and that's going to be me and Paul Dini. Last week it was me and Scott Snyder. People love that episode. It was uh, fantastic, uh, long, too. Paul Dini going to be back this week, and, and we're going to do uh, the Batman Beyond Return of the Joker. So good times lie ahead for us. Uh, better times in January, at the end of January, Smorgy. Don't forget, Smodco is your mother, your father, your best friend, a clergyman that never touched you, and Santa Claus, all in one. Enjoy another fine Smodco podcast right now. You want a podcast? Everybody's progress plans for that legend, Kevin Smith. Welcome to Smodcast. I'm Kevin Smith. Uh, okay, last week, everyone fell in love with the adorable Way Brothers, man. The Twitter feed blew up. Even people that were like, you know, fucking, I never listened to that band before, or I listened to that band and fuck that band. We're like, I'm going to buy that band's album now. Like, that, you guys made a lot of converts. Welcome back, part two, hey, with hey. the Way Brothers. Gerard Way? Hey, how's it going? Mikey Way. Hello. Um, so it was great. The response has been fucking massive. And we're going to go back into the their body of work with My Chemical Romance in a second. But we, just before we rolled, man, we're getting into a delicious conversation about uh, cartoon cutoffs. Like, for me, I talked about, um, I was familiar with G.I. Joe and the Transformers, of course. But uh, that was the generation after me. I didn't watch them. Like, I was done watching cartoons at that point, or at least new cartoons. Then I was into watching old cartoons like fucking mm-hmm. Bullwinkle and shit. Mm-hmm. But this is, these cats, like, came in on the fucking G.I. Joe. That's your cartoon. Yeah. And I was saying, like, how could how could you enjoy a cartoon where, where nobody dies? Like, mm-hmm. every time a missile hits a fucking ship, Cobra or a Joe uh, parachute to safety. There's no consequences to the war, which is why it's <laughs> ongoing. It'll never end with Cobra because nobody dies. Yeah. <laughs> and but you were pointing out the the difference was the movie. The movie oh, yeah. cartoon movie Duke gets shot finally. Mm-hmm. And you it. did you know that going in? No, no, it was a real like because there's blood. 
And and for the first time, like, what did they have like a PG or something? I thought everybody in the cartoon was going to stop and be like, hold the fuck on. <laughs> yeah. Somebody just got hurt. There are stakes for the first time. There are <laughs> stakes. This ain't yeah. fun anymore. Yeah. I think at that age, though, he might as well have died because yeah. that's the way I took it anyway. Really? Yeah, like, Why? Him getting shot alone? You're like, no. Yeah, at seven, yeah. I was, that, that devastated me. Well, I remember <laughs> being in the theater. No way. We watched Transformers, the movie, and when Optimus Prime dies, oh, people were weeping. Was yeah, people were weeping. Every kid was crying. What was the song? They wound up using it in Boogie Nights. Oh, oh you, uh, got you got the, the touch. touch. Yep, it was crazy. I remember seeing Boogie Nights and being like, "That song sounds so familiar." But there's a yeah. there's an amazing episode of GI Joe where it's the future, and a Joe goes into the future. I can't remember which one it is, and they've lost, and everybody's dead. And it comes it's up like on a, a Days of Future Past yeah, GI Joe. And it comes up on a computer when he's checking in the GI Joe database, and it's just all deceased. You remember that episode? I remember, I remember the the screen with the deceased over the face. Yeah, but I I don't remember like the full episode. It's pretty intense. It's a really, really, really great episode. It's yeah. one of those you don't know, like. Uh, this is what could happen. Yeah, if they don't stay till the fight's won. Yeah. Oh yeah. The only the, the only uh, the only contact in that I I mean I've seen most of I mean, maybe like ninety percent of the episodes. <laughs> like it's the only time I've ever. seen I don't understand when you guys had time to make music because you're so familiar with a, a shit ton of things, man. Uh, yeah, there from is, there's a everything about wrestling to like ninety percent of the GI and <laughs> saying that you've seen ninety percent of GI Joe is a fucking lot, dude. I, have, I think they I made have, a thousand I, episodes. I cheated though. I have the DVD. Like, yeah. Yeah. So you caught up on them later on. Yeah, as but well. I did. I watched a chunk of them. You know, there was there was a certain era where it was on at the right time. You know, either it was before school or yeah, we're too young to be rocking anyway. Yeah, we weren't cartoons. We were we rocking literally yet, just yeah. watching cartoons. Mm-hmm. It was a religious fucking <laughs> holiday in my house when they did the fall preview for cartoons. Yeah. Remember, Big remember they do like remember a prime that? time right. fucking special, like right. on a Friday night or Thursday night. It'd be like the ABC fall lineup for cartoons, or Saturday morning lineup. And in prime time, they would have a host who would tell you what was coming. They'd show you little clips or sometimes play like a whole fucking episode. And I remember like tuning in, like, fi- like that, looking forward to fall. Mm-hmm. And then at a certain point, like, I, I think it was when NBC dropped Saturday morning programming and went for a, another today show. Right. There was a certain point where they used to make a lot of stuff. And then all of a sudden one morning, one, one year they were like, uh, NBC's out of this game. We're going to go one more episode to today because we'll wind up making more money. Mm-hmm. And at that point, I because I, I remember reading that, man, like, well, I guess it's over at this point. When did you guys check out? When everybody started to become babies. <laughs> <laughs> they, you had the version of oh, something, yeah. and then you had the oh, de-age it. babies. Cap- Captain version. Caveman Jr. and everything was Jr. Flintstone Kids. And- yeah, Flintstone Kids. <laughs> like, it all, everything, and it was... Even though I love the Muppets, it was definitely because of the Muppets. Yeah, they were the pre. They, they well, that was such a success. Thing. Yeah, yeah where people Muppet were like, movie. "Oh my god, we could fucking take a concept, right? Reduce it to like a sperm age, yeah. and keep going, James reboot Bond it. Junior, reboot yeah, it. yeah. So, oh my lord, so that's how they rebooted back then. Mm-hmm. They just would make it a baby, and then then that's kind of when I think we both <laughs> fell out. I I probably I probably lingered a little bit. You know, yeah. I probably watched like. But like one or two James Bond juniors or something. My cutoff though was like the Power Rangers. Power Rangers is actually. I put it on. I'm yeah. like, I don't get it right now. Yeah. And then it. now, like years later, I understand. You could watch it and be like, there's, Oh my god! There's yeah. a different level of you know you can you can interact with it. Yeah, totally. you could be stoned and be like, This is exactly. amazing. Well, Why didn't I ever fucking see this before? Because there was no yeah. power of. Fucking yeah, I had a rediscovery of the stuff. Power Rangers not too long ago. And we meet like, people all the time, like guys and girls and stuff that are like. They talk about that like it's their G.I. Joe. Mm-hmm. And you're like, Power oh, Rangers? That's weird. It makes you feel, you start to feel old when people start referencing Power Rangers like it. Oh, it was a child. You feel really old when you have to explain who Puff and stuff is to people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That happens quite a bit. Um, all right. So you guys, when we last left off, um, we were jumping all over, mm-hmm. but let's jump into um, f- the first album starts getting radio play. Yeah. You, at what point, um, you, you were talking about, Telling people, uh, A and R reps, whoa, 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 back That's off. Right, yeah. So I guess we'll go back to that. Okay. Point. So you told those cats back off, let us develop at our own pace. Yeah. Um, what how how many how long is that? That was a year and a half to two years. Mm-hmm. And were you not scared that they would have been like, Well, we'll fucking walk and we might not come back? We had a they didn't they none of them said that, even though you knew that in the back of your head that could be a possibility. But um, I don't know, we just had such a strong self belief. That we kind of felt like, well, even if the majors eventually do pass us, pass on us, or you know, they lose the flavor for it, or it's not hot to them anymore, like 
we kind of loved what we were doing and we were building a fan base. So we're like, we'll just play to our fan base. You know, there's lots of amazing cult bands still to this day that they could fill up, you know, theaters and Irving plazas and places like that. No doubt. Man. Yeah. Now, at this, are you, at, are you just like, I'm on board or are you like, you're a fucking idiot. Let's, let's get, let's do it now. Let's sign. No, I mean, I, I totally got why we would, why we would hold off, you know, as exciting as it was, I was like, nah, you know, like we need to earn it a little bit more yeah. before we get into any of that. It's so weird. I mean, you guys had integrity. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of what it comes down it's to. It's super scary too. Cause yeah, you're basically like, it's like somebody showing up and be like, you got the green light. And they'd say uh, like some of the people we met that were like, obviously we went with Warner brothers and they were super awesome, but some of the people you'd meet were real skeevy about it too. And they, they would kind of <laughs> make like, it, yeah, they make it seem like they were doing you a big favor by wanting to basically take your band and, and wreck it. Right. <laughs> They'd play psychological games, you know. Yeah. That's all it really is. The, the skeevy and psychological. Yeah. yeah. The two the worst combination. Yeah, yeah. They're just manipulating you to to get you to, Yeah, I think to, there was one kid yeah. we met who was like, Congratulations guys, you get get to go to LA and play this for a room full of people in suits. And that's basically what they'd said and we're like the fuck we are. What is explain that, man. There's uh, uh we, yeah. There's uh we were talking about uh before we even started the showcasing. Mm -hmm. That's another that's how also that's also how bands Yeah, which we didn't know signed. until we had gotten involved in just being a band. But there's this and pop stars do it all the time, you know. I think they're probably there's probably you know, there's probably two hundred showcases going on down the hill right now. But um basically you 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 get your stuff you get into a room that has some stage lights and you play your music in front of basically executives um, and A&Rs and chairmen and stuff. And you play it as if you were playing in front of a real crowd and you play them, I guess, your best of. And then they decide whether or not they want to give you a record deal. It's, it's a real... It's a real crazy thing to learn. This is this sounds like uh, the end of Flashdance. Yeah, yeah, yeah kind of like, kind of like the end of Flashdance. You, you get hit by a bunch of water and fucking get up and whip your hair back and forth. There's that Christina Aguilera video, her genie in the bottle. I think she's basically showcasing in that video. I think that's what that setup is. If the I'm video's thinking. about that. I think it's about her I don't showcasing. Remember it. I could be wrong. Boy bands and shit like that. That's normally like what was showcased, but back then. You know, when rock was still really, really strong um, and selling a lot of records, like even rock bands were doing it. Like bands would just get together. They would just put out a demo, play like no shows. Yeah, it was like then, a shortcut for sure. Yeah, it was a shortcut. Definite shortcut. Yeah. So it, it helped to have like a presentation because they were actually looking at you to, for that as well. It's not just your music. Yeah, but. they'd be like, I, I mean, think about how weird that is. They're sitting there looking at you like your look. Like dudes are getting dressed up and like probably putting on eyeliner at you know <laughs> two in the, the yeah 10 in the morning <laughs> and i just thought it was so weird and it was such a weird concept and luckily only only one person had ever suggested that to us you know so as some as a positive or at all as a, as a positive yeah or, or at all or at all and we you know we obviously weren't gonna do it now the other way and of course is gigging yeah incessantly mm -hmm. and then eventually signing or eventually going uh, putting uh, not putting off the a&r person but eventually going like all right let's have a discussion yeah now. that's what it was it was you know we gigged a ton and then and then we said okay we're ready to have a discussion you know and they came and watched again and we're like we're still into this yeah yeah pretty much you know that and we we would say all right we're playing this club or we're playing this basement but by then they had all seen us so much because they still kept coming out to see us even though we asked them we said we weren't going to talk business, but they would still fly out and just to come see the shows. Just to come see the shows, so they were still there. And then uh, one day we were just ready to talk again. Now, who were, who was this? What was the label? It was Warner Brothers, Craig Aronson, and Tom Wally at Warner Brothers Records. And that was for the first album. That is for our second album. Our first album was on Eyeball Records, based out of New Jersey. And that that was did you get that yourself or was that also an A and R person going? To that was yourself? like just us, you know. At the time, like it was really just all a group of friends, and like it, we would just, you know, Alex would put out bands' records, and we were friends of the band Thursday, and he's like, "Oh, I'll put out your record." It was that it was that easy. It was that simple. Like that was a different thing than going to like a major, you know. And that album, but that album that is like, "Oh, I'll just put out your record," the Eyeball record. Mm -hmm. What what now? What happens with that album? Is that the one that first gets you radio play or no? No, it doesn't. Uh, that's the one that really we just toured on because we didn't have any other albums, you know. So um, you went out and kind of learned your craft, yeah. with those songs. Yeah, wrote wrote more songs. You know, we went to the UK on that album, which was really amazing because that you know, like we were saying earlier to you, 
And that's the place that really got us first was the, the UK. Yeah. Um, it, it, for everything you've done over there, those cats are always like, everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They just away, get it. Yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. So you, that's the first time you guys leave the country. Pretty much. Yeah. was the UK. Mm-hmm. It was awesome. Yeah. It's, you know, I, I never dreamed I'd ever get to go to the UK and it was like, you know, whenever I'd see the Reading and Leeds poster, I'd be like, Oh, I want to go to that one day. And like, <laughs> You know, I'd always planned on going and dreamed of going, but it didn't, you know, back in my head, I was like, that's not possible. So getting to getting to go there was just like, it was one of those moments. It was really great. And no, but do you have to do anything or somebody take care of everything? We like, were, do you have to book your travel? Do you have no, to book No, because we were opening up for the used. So we we're opening up for them and we had to drive, like only two of us could drive stick though. So, and it was on the other side of, yeah, yeah. stick shift with the other arm, you know, when a splitter van, everybody gets pneumonia, basically. So yeah, it's actually the, it, the shows are great, but everything else by that tour was the hardest thing we've ever done. Yeah. It looked like dude, like mash in the, in the, in the back of the van, it's like <laughs> yeah. dude's laid out. But these now at this point, you've been gigging by yourselves and whatnot. Mm-hmm. When you go someplace with a with a even a small label right. at this point, does somebody pay for all that, or do you guys have to? Does somebody book it? Do you have a I manager? Think, like, what I step think was Brian that? Brian paid for it. Mm-hmm. Brian Schechter, who was our our first manager, he had paid for it, like because we couldn't afford to go over there. Right, right, right. We didn't have a label supporting us. Obviously, an indie label's not going to support that. So they don't do that. Like eyeballs, like, hey man, man. Yeah, good labels, for you if you yeah. want to go to the UK, but we can't fucking. Yeah, it's so expensive, but, you know. You can't really expect an indie label to be able to afford that because it was really expensive. Um, just getting us over there and with the plane tickets and then the rental of the van and gas and the occasional hotel. Why? Where do you stay when you're not in the hotel? I think. Yeah, yeah we would just go to a, like a rest stop and just park the splitter uh-huh. and just sleep there. And sleep in the van. And when you say splitter, man, it's like uh, it looks like a glazier truck. It's not like a full bus or even a half bus. Yeah. It's a, no, yeah. yeah. It's just, it was, it's definitely like. What do they call them out here? They have a name for them in America. It's like the sprinter van. Sprinter van. Yeah. <laughs> sprinter van. You saw how many people? Your van was just what? Four people? It was five. And then Sean Simon, six. And then Eddie. Eddie. Seven. People. Seven people. And is it, um, Sprinter. I mean, it to say bonding experience, I guess, would be an understatement at that point. It was mm-hmm. but, you know. absolutely. Like, we got to know each we, other pretty intimately. We still talk about like it'll come up so often when we're on the road. Like we'll talk about that tour in Europe. It was almost like a you know, like one of those vacation movies. It was like hijinks, you know. Right. It was like oh. one after another, like something would happen, and it was just Sean lost yeah. his shoe. Yeah, I remember that was like he had one. He had to go home with like one shoe. I think they let you on the plane that way. I think they did. <laughs> There's so many less rules. Yeah, back, back in the day. Back even though day, even though nine eleven had just happened, there were still a lot less rules. Now you guys are both married. Mm-hmm. One of you has a, a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, but back then you're way single and you're in the UK. I had a girlfriend, so do you. I think I had a girlfriend, yeah. Back home, do they come with you to the UK? No, not at, when you're when you're opera this is how crazy touring was back then. You, we didn't have a cell phone. So you were you know, this is before everybody had cell phones. So you what were What year is this? This is like 2002 yeah i remember not everyone in the band had a cell phone i think we had one amongst us yeah and you wouldn't I remember we shared one yeah and then minutes were so expensive that you were still pay phoning it to talk to somebody back home oh so, yeah in in the uk you like totally at a pay phone you're talking you get like one of those phone cards yeah or yeah, yeah. For, like, it's pretty old school yeah yeah we would have to do it like that so we weren't in touch a lot at all like you would basically get in the van back then and then you weren't in touch with anybody your friends your family anybody how many shows is is um like how long are you in the UK? We were in there much longer it's than the weeks, shows right? we played. Yeah, we at least I think it was closer to a month, but there was only like twelve shows or something because they were so spread out all over Europe. Like Spain. What do you do on the days down? That was those were the roughest days because those would be like sitting in a parking lot with the heat in Spain, like just cooking you and <laughs> you're like, oh, I'm gonna go find somewhere to go, and you all you can find is like a supermarket. And because what? There's no hotel rooms. Well, you couldn't afford them, you know. You couldn't afford them. So you're just chilling out in the supermarket. Yeah, especially in Europe. The Europe, the British pound was so much higher than the dollar and think, the euro. I think we like when we were in Spain that time. I think there was one night, didn't we crash in Schecter's room? We did crash in Brian's room, and also yeah. when we'd be in the U.S., something I'd like to point out that we obviously stopped doing after some time is we would crash on people's floors a lot while you were touring yeah while we were touring even yeah. with the first album 
first album, yeah, we would we would crash on people that were at the show that were like, "Hey, do you guys need a place to crash?" We would literally sleep on people's floors. Audience members, fans <laughs> who are just probably new fans that <laughs> night, right? Like, yeah, they probably yeah. never heard of us. They were like, "All right, cool, you can you can crash on my floor." And they were always really nice and. Yeah, they were always nice. There was never a moment of like, so we're gonna get fucking our kidneys are gonna get stolen. Uh, there we woke night. up and they, so we woke up and I'm, this girl was videotaping us. That sleep, was sleeping. That was the straw that broke the camel's that back. Now it. I remember. It was on the pie ball tour. <laughs> yeah, that was in, the last time we ever stayed at we're in Maryland, right? And we were staying. Oh wow, you're probably right. And we ate all this girl's that. gushers. Yeah, we we ate a whole box of gushers. <laughs> and then we out. woke up. The sun comes up, some, one, of us, one of us wakes up, and then she's just got a video camera on us, and we're just like, all right, we got to go. Yeah. Oh, creepy. That, that was the, it. That was the end, yeah. Uh, and at that point, you're like, can we put in a contract somewhere that we have to have a hotel room? Yeah. Well, then we just slept in the van. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that, so you didn't even, when do you we progress to hotel rooms? When uh, do they like, here, boys, here's a key to something where you don't have to sleep or was, cook? When did we start getting Revenge, rooms? really. Yeah, yeah. So we got hotel rooms. Our second record, our first major label record, Three Cheers Sweet Revenge. That's when, like, we'd go over to Europe and we'd have a bus. We wouldn't in the U.S., but, like, we were getting big in, in England. So that was kind of a trip, too. Like, we'd still be playing, like, little punk clubs in America, and then we'd go over to England. And they'd be like, here's your bus. Here's the press. All the press wants to talk to you. And, like, you'd get off like you were in some big rock band. It was like being a double agent, kind yeah. of. <laughs> yeah. We're famous over in Europe. Yeah, totally. yeah right. That's totally yeah. what it was like, yeah. That's exactly what it was. Um. So the, the mark of... uh. Like ah, uh, is a bus it's your a first bus. bus by yourself? Oh yeah, yeah. And our Did first... you have to share it with anybody? No, or just your band. Well, our first U.S. bus. Remember, we we shared with Senses Fail on the Warp Tour. Right? Yeah, but was that our yeah was that our first one? That was it, right? And then from there, we just had a bus. I think I remember face to face. We were in a van. Yeah, and then I remember our first U.S. bus on Warp Tour. That was a big deal. Yeah, that's that's like. Do you bring friends on it and shit? You're like, look. Yeah, I think so. I don't, I don't. I think maybe we br we brought like a couple, like maybe John and Chum. Because yeah. that's got to feel legit. That's like, you know, that's what you see. That's your yeah. image of rock and roll is, is a fucking tour bus. It was super awesome. Yeah, I remember yeah. there was a point where, uh, like, people like people we were friends with in bands. Their their band started getting buses, and that's when I was like, whoa, something weird's really, you know, something <laughs> weird's happening. Yeah, I remember looking at a photograph of the guys in Thursday. And they had the photograph of their first bus. And they're all standing in front of it. I was like, "Whoa, stuff's happening!" Like yeah. these are all these local bands were all getting big. Like so, you know, and that was a, for the first thing I remember is them getting a bus. So you come back from the UK from the first tour from mm -hmm. the first album. The first time you go over the UK, mm -hmm. the Splitter tour, mm -hmm. if you will. And the the singles have gotten big. You've had some songs on the first album break huge, or not in America, but a couple had started to get play in England. While you were touring. While we were touring, yeah. And it literally wasn't until Not Okay on Revenge that that's when it kind of like blew up. Back home? Back home, back in America, yeah. And what was it that broke through? Was it Radio Play or MTV? It was or? a combination of both at the same time. They were still playing videos on yes, MTV? They were playing, <laughs> yeah, they were playing videos and they played it a lot. And we had two God, videos. You guys might have just gotten in under that the, the the window, right? We did, yeah. We got in under, in, under a lot of things. Like... We made it in before 360 deals. We made it in before. What are 360 deals? They're like these deals that they offer bands now where basically you give them a piece of everything because they have to rationalize why they're pumping a lot of money into you because records don't sell like they did. You know. So wait, back in the day, I mean, this was always the stuff I was fed, uh, but mm -hmm. man, I think it was kind of true. The you know the record company, they made most of the money from the records. Right. And the artists got to make all the sweet money from the tour and yep. stuff and yep. shit like that. Yep. <clears throat> now... There are 360 deals, meaning, hey, we get a piece of everything. Yeah, even they get the tour? a piece of everything, even the tour. Like, they kind of partner with a band. And it's, you know, it's very upfront. There's nothing sneaky about it. It's just kind of like, this is the way it is. Like, if you guys The economics of the yeah. business have changed mm -hmm. and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's true, man. There are people, I, whole departments that don't exist at record companies anymore. Right, yeah. So, um, so you got in before that. So you yeah. got in a time where people were like, What's the opposite of 360? The uh, normal deal? Normal deal, which I think is like basically, yeah, like you just said, like they get, it, they just deal with the records and mm -hmm. then you, you get everything else and, you know, um, but, you know, so MTV start playing us a ton and so did the radio and then it, it just took off after the first song. Now, um, and you're the, the stuff, the, the videos are very visually mm -hmm. oriented. So naturally it's like, it plays insanely well on MTV. Thank God you got in before they stopped fucking playing. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah, nice. we got, we got really, we were fortunate, you know, to be there in that window. 
Because yeah. I'd be, you know, I'd be real bummed if I was like, oh, I never had that moment where, you know, you see your video. Because you grew up yeah. watching videos. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Point. yeah. So yeah. for you guys to feel like, oh, my God, we've had the complete journey, that would have to have been a part of it as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Do you remember your first music video? Well, we shot our own on the indie label for Vampires Will Never Hurt You, and that was really fun. Right. And that was... Who directed, technically? Mark uh, Mark Dibiak. Yeah. Mark Dibiak. And Jay Dibiak and... <clears throat> Yeah, who had done all the graphic design with us for our indie label stuff, and then that was technically. But then our our first, I guess, like major label video where you show up and there's like trucks with lights and there's people running around with headsets and stuff. That was not okay. That you didn't like it? No, no, no. Oh no, that was the name of the song. Oh, <laughs> <Not okay. laughs> I was like, wow, that's a that was a high school out here, right? It was a high school out here. Mark Webb, who did Amazing Spider Man, yeah, yeah, Spider Man yeah, he did that, and I remember collaborating with him. We collaborated right away. Because I was like, I don't want to look like a boy band and I don't want to, like, I was really cautious when I read the treatment, but he was like, no, no, this will be cool because it's you guys and you guys are totally juxtaposed. Who did the tri- the treatment? He did. And then, you know, he kind of like listened to us in terms of what we'd want stuff to look like. I was like, well, can it look like Rushmore? And could we, you know, I was a big fan of that movie. Right. And, uh, and then we started collaborating from that point on. Did he do a lot of videos with you? Yeah, he did. Then he did Helena. He did like six of them. But yeah, it was right. Like six. He did teenagers. So you guys had a shorthand at that point. Where yeah. You just like get Mark, man. Yeah. 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 We were we were super comfortable around him, and you know he taught us so many things. What were the budgets on your music videos back in those days? I don't remember the early ones. I just remember Black Parade with Sam Bayer. Ghost, I remember Ghost. Is of that you. who directed Sam? Sam Bayer did uh, Black Parade, but Go, Go, Ghost, Ghost of You was how much? Five, right? It was, it was a lot. It's like half a million to do Ghost off the side. Half a million dollars. Yeah, it was happening. Yeah, something that would never happen nowadays. That, yeah, I was gonna say like yeah. I know they don't spend that kind of money anymore. But they like they used to spend like weird crazy money at one point. I yeah. Michael Jackson, Janet Jackson oh, well, like, videos, uh, yeah. like videos with the the jet skis and the explosions, yeah. full movies. And so by the time, well, all right, wait, go back to the Black Parade video real okay. quick. Sam Bayer directs it. Sam Bayer directed that one. And you know that you know what that cost? That was because we shot Famous Last Words in the back lot, outside of where we shot Parade um that night so we shot two videos in one day and that was close to a million the video he did both was yeah he did both and that the video for black parade was so expensive that's how he made it work if you've never seen the video for black parade it is it's it's really one of the most visually interesting videos you'll ever fucking see and and for me i it was something i saw secondary my first Mm -hmm. music video was that uh oilers video right i remember you YouTube. sending that yeah, to the, me on twitter yeah the once yeah. in oilers uh thing so when i finally saw the video i already had an impression of what the song was about right and suddenly you're watching like oh this is what the song's about right, 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 right um but it's it's fucking haunting we really went for particularly like a, yeah yeah we went for we were really trying to go for this kind of cabin dr caligari totally. we've always been in it for i remember time. the floor remember the floor the the spray paint yeah getting we, high we off closed, it. yeah we closed the door and we were shooting you know, these, these live performance scenes in the room was filled with like. So you're huffing pain. Oh, yeah. oh man, it was rough. We got <laughs> these massive headaches, you know. Is it literally like playback and you're lip syncing the songs and stuff? We really play and sing, but essentially you are. You right. know, because it, it they did they're playing a track really and they have to play it really loud because otherwise you wouldn't hear what was going on. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. And so you're you're you know, we're we go for it on every take like we're really doing it. Um but it's really hard to do a video live. We almost did Watchmen that way, and it was, it was just impossible to do. It's like those lights are like the sun. Watchmen, you know? where yeah. you guys get thrown into the paddy yeah. wagon fan? Yeah, Zach had wanted, I think, us to play it live. I think that's what he had wanted, and then I think it was going to be too we, difficult. I think we played, we played like maybe, you know, like six, seven takes live. and then Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did some we did. live passes yeah. on that one. So, And he just edited it in with the track, and it worked. When you looked at the video with all the effects in it, mm-hmm. and it was all done and whatnot. Did it look like what you saw in your head? It looked a lot. Um, it looked even crazier than what I'd kind of seen in my head. You know, it really was unbelievable. And like all that in the sky, everything that looks like it's snow is just yes. like it's ash. You know, and it's like burning your eyes, and it's like that real stuff. That, that's what that was real ash. Yeah, real. Oh, ash. that's right. It would get. It would get. You know, everybody would have to kind of turn their heads so it wouldn't get in their eye. I mean, it's crazy. Because this is in the days before, like, we'll just throw that in post. Yeah, 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 it was before that. So so it was just burning embers everywhere. And, I mean, I remember just walking on the set for that and being like, oh, my God, this will, if this ever happens again, that'll, you know, that'll still shock me. Like, this is such a big production, you know. 
Um, when it uh, now did they shoot that in advance of the album coming out? Or? By about three weeks or something, I think. Yeah, pretty close. Sounds about right. Yeah. And so, had they decided like uh, we definitely want to do Welcome to the Black Parade? Yeah, that was that was you know, and the thing is, we never really had any arguments with our label about singles uh-huh. because we kind of felt like it was a partnership in that way, and it's like, well, we should all probably just agree on one, right? Right. right. And that was the one that was pretty obvious to all of us, like let's go with this one first because it's kind of the cornerstone of the whole album. And they didn't fight it or anything. They were like, no, we did. Yeah, they, they totally agreed. Yeah. Yeah. It was so, like everybody's gut was to immediately go with that song. Like, yeah. Unanimously. It is. If you haven't listened to it already um, and you're going to hear it a lot today, um, it is for my money, one of the greatest songs ever made. <laughs> um, and I, that's now I base that on the fact of playability, what it means to me, everything, every song's a, personal experience of course but um I, I think it's an amazing epic song but we rarely get the opportunity to do something like this so i figure like if you can endure this yeah we'll go just piece by piece because you know you know what i'm saying you hear a song and you love a fucking song and then you sing it repeatedly and you you feel you know what it means but so rarely do you get to sit down with somebody and be like what that mean mm-hmm. what that mean and they'll be fucking accurate like i remember when i went to film school in canada I was sitting there listening to a directing teacher, nice enough guy, but I'm mm-hmm. sitting there going, why the fuck am I listening to what this guy says that Jonathan Demi was trying to say with Silence of the Lambs? That mm-hmm. was the film of the moment. I was like, if I heard it from Jonathan Demi, right. then I think I would you know, believe it, but why am I listening to somebody's interpretation? Right. So uh, to go right to the fucking source, man. Right on. All right, here we go. All right. Man. So we're going to we're going to break the song down and so you know folks that are like rock they're going they can't don't get too into it cuz it's going to stop <laughs> and it's going to be painfully irritating. <laughs> um so listen if you've never heard Welcome to the Black Parade before by My Chemical Romance, make sure you go listen to it from top to bottom then listen to this breakdown. All right, here we go. You wrote that first? That came last. Get out of here. Yeah. Like uh, last that's the that's the most important part of the fucking song. How does that come last? That is the it's the deceptive like come on in. Yeah. I'm going to tell you a simple story that turns into a fucking epic. It relatively came last and and here's what I mean by that. So there is a song <clears throat> uh that we're working on in pre-production at the Paramore and we cannot get this song into shape. Right. And to me my biggest problem with the song was it didn't mean anything. You know, it wasn't about anything. It was just kind of like, I don't know, it wasn't grabbing me, but it was obviously one of the catchier songs we were writing, you know, and all we had was like a verse and a chorus and maybe some kind of bridge or something, Mm. but that was all there was to it. And I hated the lyrics. And I remember like, like Craig would keep bringing it up or people would still bring the song up because we'd be recording our album and there's we still didn't have like that song that said what the album was, you know? And I was like, well, let me go into this. And I remember just kind of thinking, you know, once I came up with the the kind of whole black parade kind of concept, Mm -hmm. that's when stuff like, I was like, Oh, like let's have a marching band and let's have a, let me, this is going to be the song. So basically kind of gutted the song and kind of started over. We just kept the feeling of what this song had been. And then it needed, this kind of beginning and i remember um which was we needed something to lead us into the marching band happening right so that was this i remember being with rob cavallo and where he they had this amazing piano at el, el dorado and i'd had this melody in my head and he played it out and that was when we did i think we recorded it right there so i think the one we used is pretty much relatively a demo from when you were just like, and what do you like do? You go like, it. it would sound like that. Da, da. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he, you know, and I would kind of be like, no, this note and then this note. And then, then we go to this note and then I'll sing this. And it built that way. And then that whole introduction built of the song. With the, with the band, with the, the, the percussion. Right. What sounds like marching band right, stuff. Right. It all came from that piano, which essentially the rehaul, the overhaul came last, you know. So if the piano and then the marching band mm-hmm. came sort of last, then it would have just been, what would it kick in with musically? Just dun, like when the, when the song came. It kinda... was like a drum beat into just the beginning of, you know, everything past the intro, I think, right? There was an intro. 
It just was different. There was an intro. And again, the oh, intro. Oh, I remember the yeah, other intro now. The intro didn't really mean anything, you know, not too much. Right. You know? it and was, the, it was some ring outs, right? Yeah, it was like. Uh, What's a ring out? Like guitar ring. You kind of like. Bow. Oh, like when you pluck it and bow. fucking hold your like, hand yeah, up in the air like a rock Some star. ring outs, yeah. Right. It was just some chords, yeah. And it just didn't, it wasn't about anything, you know. And I, I'd always been really hard on songs because I really needed them to mean something. Right. You know? And this was the hardest song to record. It was the hardest song to finish writing. It was, uh, this was the one. This was hard. This took weeks to like record properly. I mean, this is, but then that's proof positive. Mm -hmm. The fucking great things right. come out of all that fucking effort. Really? Mm -hmm. So you would imagine with this being like a cornerstone song that would have been like started here, everything else built from. Right, right. The record was called Black Parade before we even had a Black Parade song. Was there ever any, did anyone ever go like, Hey man, is, do you have a song called the black parade? Right. Nobody really did. I don't, I don't think we, we, nah, we, it didn't really happen at all. I guess because we were so into the concept that we felt like either a, it didn't need it. Or if that song wasn't there, it didn't come. It just didn't come, you know? And for those folks that don't know, what is the concept of welcome to the black parade to the, to the black parade album? The concept is about this guy named the patient, um, who's basically in the last moments of his life. And he's just kind of going on this journey throughout moments of his life and kind of on his way into death, you know? Let's and what, where does this come from? You, you didn't go, I'm, I mean, aside from what I hearing about in last episode, you fucking having a gun to your head at one right. point, you didn't go through a, a, that was your near death experience, but that's not really related to this is about no. somebody at the end of their life. So what yeah. makes you think about doing this? The experiences <coughs> of being in the experiences of being in, my 20s and feeling lost and kind of aimless felt as close to death as i think i could have imagined right and i spent a lot of years like that and i think that's why i use the metaphor of death right and it's a lot about so this song really is about self-actualization you know becoming like like kind of turning into your final form or whatever um and it's and the death metaphor on the whole album is from being in your 20s and feeling basically dead. You know, that's why I related so much to train spotting when that movie came out. Why? I felt that that was the message of the movie that, you know, it was like watching a bunch of ghosts on screen anyway. And right. it's like, yeah, like desolate and hopeless and right. you're never, you're never going to get out of wherever it is you are. Yeah. So it felt like being in your 20s was basically death, close to death. It <laughs> felt like. And so is there a, is there a Mark Renton then in this? Like, does the, our guy who's kind of metaphorically speaking in the concept album, he, he goes, he's, he dies. I see. Yeah. I see the patient as that kind of character, like our protagonist who's, you know, he, maybe he's not the best person. Maybe he's not the worst person. He's just, he's just you and me, you know? God, that's so fucking artsy. <laughs> um, you, t do you tell him that? Like, how do you explain, like, when you have it down in your head where you're like, oh, I think I know what the album's going to be. Right. You showed me sketches. You yeah. drew shit. Yeah, drew I drew a bunch a of, of stuff, shit. and it was all, like, pages of drawings of, like, us on a float, you know, with the city behind us and the, the blimps in the background. and Which was an image from the video. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, wow. And the uniforms, and, yeah. like, I'd wanted to do this death rock version of Sgt. Pepper's is really what, you know, I kind of wanted it to look like. I feel like there you go so that was that's the vibe like, that's, let's do this yeah <laughs> so even before you hear so perfect like songs you're seeing imagery or no while the songs are coming yeah like we're working on songs together and as they're starting to form i'm starting to see this bigger picture come uh, and then i get this kind of you know vision so to speak of both the black parade and what it means and what it is and I'm like, oh, we have to become this. This is what we have to become in order to make this record. We have to go to the darkest, darkest place. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's, that's so fucking genius. Yeah. What now, prior to this, growing up, did, what what is your idea of a concept album? Like, what are the concept albums that are, what made you think, like, oh, I know, I'll do something that's kind of all connected? The Wall. And Ziggy. Ziggy, yeah. and Ziggy those right. were the two, I think those were the two sparks we were like. Yeah. And Night at the Opera. Yeah. By Queen, which is, I don't think it's a concept record per se, but it. I don't know. The themes are tied on that record. Um, how fucking awesome for you that you got to do yours. Like not everyone's guaranteed yeah. to do a concept album and no. shit. And not many people would be like, uh, fuck it. Let's try it. Third fucking record in. Right. Third in. Yeah. But I guess that would be the time to do it. Right. Like it's the time to kind of put up or shut up. I think at that point for us, because it was like a lot of, I guess we had been written off in some respects on the second record by maybe 
certain kinds of media for, you know, when the thing is like when you're a band that the youth culture listens to, like you, like rock critics will immediately kind of write you off, you know? And it's later when these kids that listen to you become rock critics that they, you know, talk about bands like maybe the way they should have been talked about, you know? Right. All right. Time. When your audience grows into it, when, right. when your audience has a voice. Right. When your audience finally has a voice because yeah. they don't when they're, when they're 14. So we were riding off a lot of that. And then it was really like put up or shut up for the third record. It was like, we have to make the most bat shit thing we can. And this is still, you're with Warner brothers at this point mm -hmm. still. Yeah. So um, you tell these cats like, Hey, I'm going to do a concept album. Do they go like right on? Because that right away, if I'm a guy in charge of the record right. label, I'm like, how the fuck do we spin singles off of a concept album? Yeah, it, it was, it was, I don't know that there was any fear from the label. It was definitely like, okay, that's what you want to do. And then, and then, but I think the proof was in the music that we made when, you know, when Tom Wally sat down and listened to it, I think he didn't have any questions. I think right then there. Yeah. Just, we were kind of like, this is either going to, you know, people are totally not going to get this whatsoever or it's going to be received very well. Like we didn't, we didn't think there was going to be an in-between, you know? Yeah. How it's, sure yeah. were you? Like, you, you know, you talked about when you were first coming up with um, the sound of my chemical romance uh -huh. in the beginning that you were like, Oh, I knew we were going to, yeah not be a, be bigger than a jersey band i wasn't sure how black parade was going to be received i was sure that it was great but i was really that was like one of the most fearful times of my life because i was like i was like oh my god this could really explode were like you scared like <clears throat> like if you know something's great mm -hmm. and you're gonna put it out there at the mercy of you know fucking people that might be like meh Mm -hmm. and shit like or worse mm -hmm. uh like that i mean that was honestly one of the reasons i took red state the way i did i was i mean i had to blow up my relationship with critics to kind of make that movie in a in a fearless place otherwise right. i was going to be like what are they going to say about this are they going to see what i'm going for like i was so honestly like i love that movie so much mm -hmm. that if they didn't write was what was in my head and heart about right. it that uh, that utterly would this sounds stupid to say in very first world of course but it would have destroyed me that right. would have wrecked me right. hard because that movie meant so much to me so i went the other way where i was just like in order to to not have that be a factor when i try to make this yeah i'm just gonna blow it all up like yeah. just you know fucking burn the ships and motivate the men so to speak yeah. and the men the men was me in that case so i got like terrified of the notion of something that i that was that important to me and something that i knew that personally was fucking great right <clears throat> and ultimately wound up going F i can't i don't know if i can if i can um with withstand judgment right so i'm just going to make sure that i poison the well right like once you say it to a bunch of critics y'all suck and your jobs are fucking pointless mm -hmm. you can expect you know bad reviews from there on in right. so at that point i was like if i know i'm gonna get bad reviews then i'm at peace uh, right. you know it's like there's nothing i could do to win people back after i'm like go right, fuck right, yourselves right. so then you're motivated to do what you want to do right and not sit there going all right i want to do this but i should do this because they might say this or this right. is what people like because they're you know i'm not gonna say it's formulaic but there's a way to fucking give that group of people that write shit what they want right and that to me is i mean you know if you want to do that for a living god bless but like i didn't i'm not here to do that right. you know what i'm saying if right. i wanted to like put recipes together i would have fucking opened a fucking cupcake shop right you know i would have been a lot happier yeah, <laughs> so there's, there's ways to, to antagonize and shake the cage and yeah that. and 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 that's the idea like i i think it was when we were talking about, i don't even know if we were talking about it on there if we were talking about it afterwards but you said something where you were like it's not we were talking about the uh the phelpses at one of your shows that's like one of your shows and you were like it's really not rock and roll if somebody's not pissed off outside the show yeah totally and yeah. that sensibility goes away in a world of commerce because mm -hmm. you're like well you can't piss everybody off because we gotta mm -hmm. make fucking money and shit so mm -hmm. I, for me my process was like the tnt stick and okay blowing up the bridge you were you got more courageous like you were like fuck it let's put it out there and go wide with it like, i think it was kind of like the feeling it was two things one was total silence at the time mm -hmm. seemed to really work for us and like zero not a peep out of us just cooking this thing and then i guess kind of blowing up i guess the 
the TNT we were using was in the studio. We were trying to blow it up while we we're doing it. Like, you know, almost like, let's just pretend this is not pretend it's the last one, but like it might be. Let's play it like yeah. this is it. Yeah. Um, all right. So that's, and that's where the opening piano comes yeah. from. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're that deep into the song. All right. Here we go back into it. Why piano? Um, that's a really good question. It was a it was a kind of newly discovered instrument for us at that point, and it was it was like getting a whole other arsenal of weaponry. Getting the piano because you could do so much with the piano that you can't do with your guitars. Like emotion right yeah, away, yeah. a single plank of a. One, oh my god! You it. you can grip someone by a heartstring yeah. in a way you can't really, I guess, with a guitar. You can't like, you know, and guitars can do amazing things. But like when we play that song live, all it takes for James to hit that one key. And then it's just like, <sighs> oh, I've seen it. You go to YouTube, well, no. man. There's you guys on one of the videos on YouTube. You perform it in Mexico. Mm -hmm. I mean, it looked like fucking 10, 20,000 people mm -hmm. there or something like that. And, you know, the opening, I, I was there for a live performance mm -hmm. when we were in Asbury Park the, at Bamboozle. The boys played there. And soon as that one piano note yeah. comes the place fucking erupts and now naturally at that point there's a lot of familiarity people i know what that fucking piano mm -hmm. means the song's about to begin mm -hmm. but it's it's such a wise choice because right away it, it invites almost anybody in because anybody responds to a piano note right and you know even though rock was really big at the time i was you know i think we were really looking for ways to emote past it because right. We could see that, like, just power chords and stuff, like, it wasn't so much that we didn't care if it was working commercially or not. It just wasn't working for me, like, uh, in every song, you know? And I don't think it was working for the guys to have that just, you know, ah, oh, what are we going to do again? All right, well, I guess we'll chug into something. You know, we've already made two records. Well, it feels like there's a ceiling to that, too. Yeah, like, in is. terms of emoting, it's like, I can only say so much with a power chord, whereas, right. you know, you could do something else. You could tell a different word with a different set, set of tools. You said yeah, different Marshall. set of tools, yeah. All right. When I was a young boy, my father took me into the city to see a marching band. That's just beautiful. It makes me want to cry right away. <laughs> now, um, the, right as you're writing this, you're writing for the concept at this point. Yeah, I'm the, writing the patient. a bit from personal experience because there's a distinct memory that I'd have of, you know, our dad taking us. Uh, to New York to see a parade and I definitely remember that I don't even remember what the parades were maybe it was Thanksgiving I don't even remember do you remember that I don't remember I was probably really he was really little. little and I have a I had a real strong memory of that you know and I I used it again as metaphor for this character yeah there's an aching in that song that you, yeah. it's not artifice you can't mm -hmm. and even though you're playing a concept album or doing a concept album that that kind of emotion, man, you can't fake. Yeah, everything in it is, you know, as much as it's a concept or a record, there's so much of that record's real, you know. He said, son, when you grow up, would you be the savior of the broken, the beaten, and the damned? All right, that is a heavy fucking lyric. Yeah. Right there. To me, that line is, like, really about accepting, not you know not the god complex part of it it just sounds good that whole savior thing you know that's never anything i was ever interested in being but to be able to take ownership over at least the representation of a certain group of people that were yes. basically you yes you know and and just the people that relate to you it's not for anybody else and to take ownership over that i think was a big self-referential thing to the band um and that's why that lyric's in there, you know. Oh, such a fucking good lyric. Did you hear yourself kick in yet? Have yeah, you I heard... think I think I've come in at this point, I think. I think you're about to, yeah. Oh, I'm about to. I can't remember. He said, Will you What the fuck? How can you not remember? How many times have you guys performed? I remember the song? it's it's when the snare drum comes in. I'm not that one. I'm I'm two from that. <laughs> what how many It's all feeling. It's like it's just muscle memory. So like if we if we you know, like almost like like you sat here and you asked me like how many repeats of the bridge i wouldn't be able to tell you <clears throat> it's like essentially it's like driving where you're yeah. like i could get you anywhere in town but don't fucking ask me to tell you what streets and when to exactly, turn just get yeah. in the car and i'll get you there happily. yeah it's like that yeah Beat them, you demons and all the non-believers the plans that they have made 
You're 49 seconds in and already this is a great song. <laughs> like you must have known that when you were writing it. When we, yeah, when we recorded that part, I remember that was so awesome to record. I remember recording the vocal for that and you could just feel how awesome it was. Like you just knew it was going to be really special. Um, And when you guys, when you record the song, you record it in pieces, you're all in the same room. I think pieces at different times because it was such a long process. Like I know there were some nights that went till three a.m. That yeah, it was it was. It was Where'd you do it? Where was this one? El Dorado Studios in Burbank. Yeah. Um. Do you uh, did you how many did you do there? We did the whole record there. But how many did you ever go back for another record? Oh oh, we just did the one record there. We just did Black Parade. You don't go back. You don't go like fucking things I've, went well there. I've passed. I've passed by it. You know, and I always. I haven't seen it since we recorded there. Really? Yeah. I haven't yeah. seen it. A lot of really great memories. Yes. I mean, one would argue or could argue that that's like the recordings too that might have changed your lives. Right. Probably the most. Pretty right. much, yeah. yeah. Pretty it's much. almost like a church. I would go back there every Sunday. And just be like, <laughs> that's where the magic is. That's true. Because one day I'll leave you a phantom to lead you in the summer to join the Black Parade. Why the summer? Um, that's when parades, I mean, obviously, yeah, I, I kind of, I, I guess at a gut level, that's when parades are supposed to happen. Right. It feels like it's supposed to, or this book, or if somebody would pass, they'd come back in the summer maybe, because maybe this is like a winter, like a winter of the soul or something. I don't know. Summer sounded right. What kind of heavy conversation is this to have with a kid at the fucking parade? Though, man? <laughs> <laughs> Bring a kid to the parade and you're like, listen, you're Jesus. <laughs> And I'm going to die. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to come back and lead a parade. <laughs> but that's what's I, what, that, what I dig about it lyrically. is just like it doesn't mince around. Yeah. It puts it right on front street, Prophecy. man. All the, all the best reviews yeah, that I'd seen. I think was, there was like a Blender review, too, that was like, God complex, check. This, check. It was all this like, you know, ridiculous proclamations, check. Like it, <laughs> it was all the really, it was stuff that that stuff makes me laugh. Like I think at this point or did it make you laugh then? It did make me laugh then. It made me laugh when I'm doing it too. It makes me laugh. Why? Because you were like, uh, I've got all the pieces that are necessary. Cause it's so fucking nuts. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, and, I mean, and if, you know, stuff like that, it pisses off the people that, you know, you want it to piss off. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Do we think, like, do you think like David Bowie didn't like, Paint a lightning bolt on his face, do a line, look at himself in the mirror, and go, "This is fucking nuts." Start laughing, you know? He must have. He must have. So at this point, when you're doing the same thing, you're like, "This is crazy." Do you feel like yeah. I'm getting away with something? Or sooner or later, oh, they're going to be like, "You don't know if you're going to get away with it. You're just doing it." You know, I kind of had this sense, like, "I don't know if I'm going to get away with half of these lyrics, but I'm just going to do them." And they work, man. Yeah. What's yeah. crazy is we were completely sober at the time, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, we didn't drink, you know? Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah. We all didn't drink, so it was like, you know. Super military. And how old are you? Uh, I was 25, I think. I 24, 25. I mean, and there's all the earnestness of your mid-20s in this yeah, song as Yeah, totally. Well. Yeah, totally. You're never going to, I mean, even though it's oddly a song about melancholy and and, you know, a song from the perspective of somebody who's, on their way out, you wouldn't get a song this beautiful or this powerful or this earnest from somebody who was even closer right. to that, to the end. Um, it, it, in some weird way, 20 year olds really embrace the notion of, of death in such a, a vivid, passionate way. It's really crazy because the older I get, I lo I, I definitely lost that. It falls away, doesn't yeah, it? It falls away and I don't know where it goes and I'm glad it does go away, but right. your fascination with death you start to become more fascinated with life. It's really crazy. Yeah, that's like around, yeah, that, that period of like the early 20s, like there's like everybody goes through a quarter life crisis, you know? Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. It's like in everyone, a bad way. Everyone loses it around, you know, beginning of the 20s to mid 20s. Like yeah. Something will happen. Save you can weather that storm, kids. Mm -hmm. you make it out the other side, man. You grow up and, and suddenly embrace weird shit like <laughs> life, having kids. <laughs> Now, who wrote this? I can't remember. I think that seems like a collaborative thing. I mean, it was yeah, all I, stemming off the intro. Yeah, I think I think those notes were parts of the ring out that we initially had, but we added some stuff. There was it was probably simpler than that, and then and Ray and Frank put their licks on it. Yeah, put these guitar bits on it. <clears throat> and what come first, lyrics or music? I think I asked a version of this question before. Um, lyrics. 
lyrics come basically during the process they kind of come after like they kind of it like hopefully they come while you're in the moment doing it and you just kind of jot them down real quick because you have to Mm -hmm. sometimes they come after sometimes you don't find the right line until until later but then it's not as exciting when that happens you know so it's kind of like it's um throw it into the realm of sex it's coming together as opposed to Right. Uh, yeah, I finished, but you'll off, you go ahead. You finish now. Yeah, this is it's more like, like ah, it happened at once. Yeah, exactly. It all kind of happens at once. It bubbles up, and this is definitely that kind of song where like lyrics were getting written as we we're moving. You know, parts are getting written while we're moving. You know. And when you when lyrics are being written, is it anybody's game, or are you like, no, I'll write the lyrics? I've always just written it myself. Nobody's ever been like, hey man, why don't you throw in a fucking lyric about a duck? And you're like, a duck, fuck you. Or uh, I mean, I'm always open to stuff, you know, like I've had, like if I get stuck and things like that. See, I'm totally always open to stuff. Yeah. But generally speaking, it's just where it's <laughs> widely held. Like Gerard's got the lyrics. Yeah. I usually, yeah, I write the lyrics. Um, okay. So you write, you, you present these lyrics to him. Obviously uh, he's, you always got his support more mm-hmm. or less, but what about the other, the, the other dudes? Everybody was so into it. I right mean, it was, away. again, it was a thing that we were doing as we were doing it. So it was like, you know, I don't think any of us even knew the lyrics until I was singing them. You know, I didn't really know them until I was singing them. So it was kind of like you would just kind of hear it for the first time as it was being recorded. Honestly, I can't understand that process. Yeah. It's it's weird. It's like, um, um, I don't even know what to compare it to. Like, I'm so literal minded mm-hmm. where I'm like, no, something, there has to be an order. Yeah. Right. Music will always be a, like, I have a math block when oh. it comes to that stuff. It's a weird thing. When you uh, showed me some of the lyrics, just the subject matter was heavy so i was like wow you know like sometimes you don't realize how heavy some of them yeah like you want to sit them down and be like are you all right (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) should we have a conversation (laughs) yeah totally come to the close of the song Mm -hmm. there's nothing remotely melancholy about it like that's what it begins so melancholy and that's what kind of draws you in i think but it turns into a celebration for a song that sounds like it's about death in the beginning Mm -hmm. it oddly becomes a celebration right of life Mm mm-hmm Why repeat it? That's a. I'm glad you asked that because I wanted to say those words again, but I wanted to do it really intense this time, and that was absolutely sure that I had to repeat because I was like, no, I have to say this shit again, and I have to say it like I really mean it. So it's almost like I have to flip that switch, and that's exactly where the switch gets flipped for the rest of the song. And what is the switch? The switch is just kind of like that internal thing where you're just like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna activate. Yeah, that yeah. part's like, it's like the plane taking off kind of deal. Yeah. And then it just goes, boom. Yeah. And is that every song? Um, Songs with a lot of dynamic, mm-hmm. but this is a special kind of song where it was like the most real activation, you know, that I can remember happening in a recording studio where I was just like, all right, we'll repeat it because I'm going to sing it again and I'm going to sing it really loud now. <laughs> and then everyone was just like, yeah, do it, do it. It was, I think it was really late. I can't even remember who was at the studio at that point. I think it was super late when I cut this beginning. Yeah, I remember you, you came back with it and I think I went to Schechter's room and you right. were there and we listened to it and I was just like, whoa. Now, was there space for it or do you then have to then build the in song, space? Yeah, the song did have a structure and that was one of the hardest things to work out because it was such a complex song that we knew these things were going to exist. We knew there was going to be lyrics here. We knew there was going to be singing because I would sing like scratch or something like that, Mm -hmm. you know, or, and we had a structure and we had a good foundation. So we, you know, but there was a lot of sections. So it took a lot of time to make all those sections work together. You know, it took like a week. So when you were like, Hey, I want to repeat this. Mm -hmm. If you hadn't repeated it, would that have just been, a big musical section without you singing on top of it that or it wouldn't be there probably it wouldn't be there so it would go right from right into the right into the thing which is on the radio edit i think it goes like they take out the second one they take out the second do they really they do oh that's a bummer because it is that it's it's i was gonna i don't know how else to say it but it's so fucking rock and roll to like Mm -hmm. ah, like you do scream like you go from the very sweet intro right to the same intro, but with like such fucking intensity mm-hmm. and starts taking off and, and that grabs you. And suddenly it is like somebody sitting next to you on a bus going, 
when I was a young boy, my father took me to the city. And, you know, you're like, oh, it's really sweet. And then all of a sudden, they're like, when I went, and they're shaking you by the lapel. Did you hear me? And you're like, yeah, 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 man. Holy shit. <laughs> I'm glad you and your old man had a good time. That's exactly what that section is supposed to do. It, yeah. it, and you do kind of launch at that point. Yeah, you're the crazy person on the bus at that point. <laughs> If you've never heard this song before, at this, this point, you're like, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> we jumped in so softly, and now it sound, it does sound like a, almost a militaristic march. Uh -huh. And then you're like, all right, I guess I got a beat on the song. This uh -huh. is what it is now. And then it's about to take another change. Yeah, and then it changes right away. Is that what you call it? Is it a change? Is yeah. it like? Yep. And how many more changes do you think are in at that point? Change, change, change. It's like three or four. It yeah. goes back. It goes back to like a reprise of the beginning. Right. Yeah. It's a little it's slower. Like it's a bridge, but then it gets into it. The bridge is real fast. The bridge has its own breakdown that happens, and then it's got an outro. Oh yeah, the bridge. The bridge. It's 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 a totally different speed from everything's a different speed. You know? Yeah. In this song, we we had to play it to a map, and a map is basically, um, <clears throat> it's like when a lot of songs people play them live, and it's just one tempo. It's like it's like I don't know, like one thirty eight is the BPM, right? And then. But songs like BPM this, is beats per minute. Yeah, beats per minute. And then, but a song like this will have so many different feelings that need to happen exactly how they're supposed to happen that you need to do a map, which is that the the, the BPMs change. It's like a mountain range. Yeah. So like is that if you're playing it live, is the drummer just like, oh fuck you guys? No, because Bob would play to a click, and even in the studio, you had a click that would map. It was mapped out the tempo, and then the change would happen, and then he would know, like, all right, now I'm a little bit faster. And so, but, and eventually he just loses the click because you just play it so many times or does he always have to he work? he always did it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That? And it's like, it's totally like, it's like when you have that click track on, you start to get so, like, you start to enjoy it. You're like, it's super locked it helps in. you play really? better. It helps, it helps you do things that you were like, whoa, I have all this, you know, time to do this fill or you know, stuff you, you wouldn't necessarily. What is it? It's literally just tick, tick. Yeah, it's like, like, like one really of those things, loud. like a it like a metronome. Any, yeah, thing? it could be any sound you want, but it's usually the metronome sound. Yeah, but it could be like you know they have different programs, like they have a Darth Vader one. Hmm. What do you mean? Somebody's like, <gasps> yeah, it's like they, they, yeah, they have <laughs> really? a Darth Vader. Yeah, one? they have a Darth Vader one. Yeah, oh, amazing. Where it's like his breathing or whatever, and that's the fucking beat that you're working yeah. to. Yeah. Um. All right, man. This I I I'm I'm digging this. Hmm. This is an education. <laughs> This is where it turns just so badass. Yeah. Where did this piece come this from? This is remnant. This is a remnant of the original song. This is now, now we're into, now this part's going to make sense because of what came before it. So but but, this, is so this used to be part of a song that you were like, I don't really yeah. like what the song is. Yeah, it was about. like there was something missing. We, didn't, something missing. we didn't know what to do. It was kind of sitting for a while. Mm -hmm. like, so you're like, I like this piece. Let's jam it in here. Now yep. we've got a home for it. Now we've got a home for it. And now I think some of the notes did change too, like a little bit. And then, yeah, then that's where we have this. Is this like of all the songs that you guys do, is this the most difficult one to do live? Uh, No, I don't think so. I'm trying to think of the most difficult one to do live. These are high no notes to hit. That part sucks. Singing? Yeah. This yeah, is like sometimes if you watch you do it live, sometimes, yeah. like there are many more. Of course, uh, whenever you watch somebody perform, you got that many people, it's fun mm -hmm. to let them sing. Mm -hmm. But there's that whole section yeah. where you're like, you guys fucking Yeah, sing. you're just doing, I'm out of air. I can't, yeah, you're like, I can't do this anymore. But it's really sweet. And it's like I was there for it live in Asbury mm -hmm. Park, and it's, you know, you roll tears instantly because you hear the whole fucking audience going, when I was. Yeah, it's pretty oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah, and they just take over singing and stuff. And I would imagine that is a tough note to it. Now, how many times you're on the road? Uh, let's say you got 20 gigs in a row. How many times do you try to hit that high note? Well, that stuff in the beginning isn't as bad as the stuff in the stuff in the chorus is like. We're like, I. It's no. like, well, carry on. Yeah, yeah. That stuff. Oh, yeah, mega high. Yeah, hitting yeah. carry ons and stuff. Yeah. And then you got to do it again. And then it's like a double that happens where you got to do it again and again. And you're just like, you just learn over time, you learn where to find the air to do it, you know? 
Well, in the studio, you're not running around either. No, in the studio, you're not running around. In the studio, you can pause if you need to to get something cleaner. You can do that kind of stuff, you know. You how do you do – so how do you move around the stage and sing without sounding like – <laughs> that takes the longest to learn i think and that's just is learned from years of doing it you know and it still doesn't sound as obviously as great or perfect rather as it does on a on a cd but it takes years of basically doing it yeah it's the only way to learn it you just more. learn where to breathe essentially yeah you learn and breathe off mic and because there's no i mean sometimes you're singing lyrics you got like this much space be like <gasps> yeah and get it in and you but you learn. don't hear that i never hear you know, while I'm at a show, you got to learn where to cut words. Sometimes, sometimes you'll have to cut a word to get to your next one. Or if you're going to, you know, sometimes you'll have to drop half a phrase just to hit the thing you need to hit. And, you know, there's a little trick. Yeah, it's almost like being a runner, you know, like, you know, the minutes you could, you know, you, get, you could take breath now. It's like, you know, oh, running and like running, running. Yeah, like yeah. running, running. Yeah. Um, man, it's the, I guess that's just like, think about it. Like, you get it right in the studio. Mm -hmm. And you're like, rock, this is amazing. And you commit it to wax or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you're expected to do it again and again and again yeah. and again and again. And do they bitch if it doesn't sound like the one uh, on a record? No, I don't think so. They're happy if it's just show. like, it's different. Yeah, they, yeah. I, I, I think people that want to complain about it just didn't like it in the first place, you know. Do you we, ever, play, we play a little faster live. Yeah, right? Do you really? Yeah, yeah, it's a little faster. Do you ever swap out any of the words? Sometimes like that's when I was in Detroit <laughs> no, or something like that. I never done that with this song. But you've done it with other songs. Yeah, I've done it with other songs. Like you, you, you'll have you, and then sometimes you'll have words where you're like, "Oh, that's a much better word. I should have used that." And then you'll just oh, really it. like yeah. you like after long after the song's done, you're like, "Ah, oh, shit." Second yeah, pass. yeah, yeah. You totally revise it. You revise it. Remix. Yeah, you remix it. You're at a show. What are, what's the crowd doing at that point? This is like the most exciting part of the song. So everyone goes ape shit. Yeah. Kind of when they lose it, yeah. yeah. Now in the Mexico version of the song or the one that they got up on YouTube, uh, like during the march, you're like Mexico fists in the air. Oh yeah, yeah. Old country <laughs> puts their fists in the air. It's got to feel like super awesome. Yeah, I know, right? That feel must feel rock and roll yeah, at that totally. point. Totally. It's one of those songs where I mean. Like we, like we want to play it. You know, there's some songs yeah. where you're like, oh man. Still we to this day, you never get tired of the song? We don't really no. get tired of Black Parade. No. Do people mosh anymore? Um, this or something like it. Depends the city. Yeah. yeah. Some, Depends, some yeah. cities are more uh, can, aggressive. Can one mosh to this song? I've seen it. This part. Yeah. They and particularly can. the next, like well, sometimes I get. This yeah. Because there's thing, a lot. Yeah. It's kind of. Yeah. yeah there's, there's, there's a, they could do it during that. Yeah. What what are they doing? Just weeping, staring at you, no, holding up lighters in the air. And there's shit? a lot of it's it's hard to explain. There's a lot of movement. Oh, the beginning. I mean, you mean this oh, when it kicks in, yeah. Uh -huh. kicks a lot of in, movement. Lot people of trying movement. to get their footing and they're bouncing and they're singing along. Actually, yeah. that's that's really what it is. Well, as soon as the singing starts in this verse, there's less movement and the movement is literally all just like finger points or fists. so all these cats are going like singing like sometimes I yeah get yeah feel yeah. really uh-huh like the whole thing mm, yeah so are you now as the singer are you like all right look i don't mind you chant in over here mm -hmm. but back the fuck off this nah, is my part i love song. it i like, love hey it now <laughs> yeah. i love it so they they're singing a lot and that allows you then to just turn the mic as well if, and yeah like, if I, if I, yeah it, it's just great to have that happen anyway even if you can't hear them right. it's still great to know they're doing it okay now where'd the she come from that's my grandma i'm, okay. I'm referring to my grandma from helena so i'm again being self-referential now is the, so you are but are you still speaking through the character is the character remembering yeah his grandma yeah, as totally. well yeah but particularly you as the songwriter is about your grandma uh i mean that that particular line you know um but you know like in terms of the concept easily could be about any number of people right that he's that he's missed but know? what does that mean sometimes i get the feeling she's watching oh, over me that's obvious that. but what is and other times i feel like i should go um it Go does. where? The mall? What? I'm just trying to think of what my original intent was because over time, like you, you stop thinking about what it meant when you wrote it. Right. So, you, you know, you sometimes will lose the original intent, you know? Um, I mean, quit, you know? Right. Like, you know, the times I feel like I should go, like maybe I should quit. Right, right, right. It's okay. So um, you have that feeling of somebody watching over you and being very supportive of you. And then there's moments where you're like, ah, fuck it. Nobody cares. So I'll quit. Explain.
plane. Threw it all the rise and fall the bottom. Um, I mean, that's just kind of really, again, referential to the band, you know, like just kind of like a rise up and like the slain enemies upon the ground to get to the point. <laughs> Beautiful imagery. Awesome yeah. rock imagery. Yeah. Uh, and when you're gone, we want you all to know. I mean, in a weird way, I never thought about it. Maybe that's, you know, we're speaking about the listener or the audience, you know, like if, when you're gone, we'll still be playing this. And the the carry on part is that where when people in the audience going ape shit on yeah the carry on yeah yeah that's a big it's point. you know I mean it like it hit squarely home for youth and then I think it hits squarely home for almost any age really mm. like there's there's a real um, spirit of endurance to right. it and that anybody can fucking relate to that you know what I'm saying they right. say when you're going through hell keep going same kind of thing like yeah and that sentiment is like as clear as it's supposed to be you know it's very much like you know you know even though you're gone we're still gonna keep going who's dead and gone i think like you know, I think it's probably referential to the opening of the song. Right. You know, when the father tells the son. Right, right, right. So we're jumping back to that point in the storytelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's beautiful. Explain yeah. that. Okay. Uh, my heart can't contain it. That's kind of the obvious. And then the anthem won't explain it. It's just, it's saying that, like, I guess the sentiment's bigger than, you know, kind of a rock radio song. You know what I mean? God, um, that's fucking bold. How old are you again? At that point, I don't remember. I don't remember. Do you think I, mean, you I was like twenty fourth? So you're like twenty seven? Yeah, maybe twenty seven. Yeah. I don't think you, you have to be twenty seven to make this song. Absolutely. But it plays for any age. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like that's what's weird and prescient about it. That somebody who hadn't lived a massive life, right, could write a song that is about a massive life and how you know big life can be. And yes. In fact, I hadn't lived much of a life at all. Isn't that nuts? Yeah. What? Do you, but what do you, what do you think? All your input was what? I think it was a reflection of that. It was a reflection, a reflection of never having really lived that much of a life at all. And then finally getting the opportunity to live one, I think, was inspirational. You know? Well, that sends you reeling from decimated dreams. Misery and hate will kill us all. Oh, Pretty that, on the nose, yeah. Such a a beautiful pure sentiment oh, like it's it, you know what it's right up to me it's right up there with um all you need is love very mm -hmm. simple mm -hmm. very straightforward yeah. you know music is always about reminding us that like uh it, in very simple form sometimes comp complicated melodies sometimes very straightforward mm -hmm. that uh, love over hate is probably the preferable way to live yeah. in this world yeah jump in on that one yeah that's pretty I, what i liked is that it's getting less abstract as we get into the verses it's getting very direct so right. it makes my my explanations easier <laughs> yeah you're like i don't think about this one this um, pretty much what it yeah says. that's pretty much what it says Want to jump in on Weary Widow? Yeah, Weary Widow. I loved the way it sounded. Well, I was going to say, I remember nerding out when I found out Lucas Haas was going to be in the video yeah. because Lady in White, we watched that to death. When we oh, were, my yeah. God. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. And that Twilight Zone episode, the 80s series. He was in, like, the first, very first episode of the Twilight Zone. 80s what did he do? What was, was the episode? Like, was, Did you watch that 80s yeah, series? It was, um, it's out now, right? It's, it's like. It holds up like it holds up really well. It's got the Bruce Willis episode in it, Shatter Day. Yes, that is one of my yeah. favorite oh, fucking television programs of wow. all time. Um, he, thought about that in a long time. It's long. Peter J. Novins. Bruce Willis plays a character named Peter J. Novins who, and this wouldn't happen in this day and age, but mm -hmm. he's in a bar. That's the setup. And he goes to call somebody, but he's dialed his own number, literally dialed because it's a rotary phone, I think. And then as he realizes it, as it's connecting, he's saying to the bartender, can you believe this? I called my own phone. He's about to hang up. And then suddenly he answers the phone 
And he's like, hello. And he's like, who is this? He's like, this is Peter. Who is this? He's like, this is Peter. And so it it starts this episode about a guy who's facing his doppelganger through the phone. And his doppelganger is like, don't come home. Like, you know, two of us can't exist at the same time, so you don't want to chance this. And so the doppelganger is Peter J. Novins is living like the life that the real Peter J. Novins should. And he's apologizing to people, calling his mother, mm. making up with relationships. And slowly over time, he's telling the other Peter J. Novins in the bar that you don't need to be here anymore. I've got this covered. You're mm-hmm. a figment of everybody's imagination. They've forgotten about you, the bad version of Peter J. Novins. I've fixed everything. So finally, at the end, they kind of, face one another and the real well and that's a question about who is the real peter j novins but the one from the bar is just a fucking wreck and 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 harried and and just uh looks like he's on his last legs of life and then the new peter j novins looks like he did in the beginning Mm -hmm. they face each other and the one disappears and then the new peter j novins takes over i was my favorite episode Mm -hmm. that was moonlighting era right it was moon it was right before moonlighting it was a young young david addison young bruce willis yeah the episode lucas was in was this this um it's like this this family lives by train tracks and and the grandfather's like oh the train's coming for me soon and like it's this track that nobody nobody uses this track anymore and like everybody's like what, like what what are you talking about you're crazy and he's got like a ticket for this train and they're like yeah you're nuts and then this ghost train shows up to pick him up and uh wait is that amazing stories it may be an episode it might be amazing, amazing stories, stories. The first it's so whimsical stories. it's either yeah. it's amazing stories my bad um the uh the other anthology series of the same era that was That's, the same year yeah, they released family too. dog family dog family dog started yeah. there yeah. it's reminiscent of in frank and weenie yeah it's the family dog it, the, the animation yeah. looks the same yeah very much so yeah man that year the network started launching anthology steven spielberg had amazing stories uh-huh. cbs is like fuck it we're going to relaunch the twilight zone and i was i leaned more toward the twilight zone one of the one of my favorite though anthology series tales from the dark side oh, oh yeah that creepy theme song yeah I used where to it's have like to... there is another world oh, yeah. and they would do this just flip the fucking screen to its uh it goes, negative wow. image and suddenly they play that <laughs> i used to i used to have to turn off the when i was really little when it was out it was like i'd turn off the song in the beginning because it's creepy just yeah. the song would give well that too has nightmares. that near 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 they just yeah. play creepy music mm-hmm. in the beginning of it but all i like their short stories better than amazing stories was always very whimsical yeah yeah it was like uh like like a grand story like well remember the one episode where the the dude's like trying to land a fucking plane oh b-52 bomber casey from uh three o'clock high he's casey shamasco yeah stuck in the he's stuck in the window and if he moves everybody dies yes he has to sit in this window to like save all of his friends and then there was i I don't know if it's that episode or the one that ends with like they they have no landing gear so the dude draws a cartoon oh that's right wheel on it where it's just like ah, that's cute but like i like the shit edgier i loved tales from the dark side had a danny aiello episode where he was a bartender yes and there was tom noonan was like this guy who he was a loan shark uh or or what is a bookie um danny uh, he's a bookie and and this guy had come into him he was always losing on bets and shit welching and stuff and then there was rumor he'd been killed by people he owed money to but there he comes back in to danny Aiello, and he's like i want to place a bet very high bet and blah 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 and he places one wins mm-hmm. places another one wins and he's cleaning out danny Aiello. but danny Aiello's whole thing is like i never cheated i never welched so you know he's paying off and stuff mm-hmm. so then finally you know the dude's just like i can't take your bets anymore you know because I'm, I'm out of money and stuff and he's just like oh are you telling me that i've shut you down and stuff he's like no i mean i just can't honor a bet i can't pay it off if you win and you seem to have a lot of good information and he's just like well let's make one last bet like i bet by midnight tonight you're dead so oh, man. danielle is like uh okay fine we'll make the bet and stuff and tom noonan comes they do some dissolves and stuff tom noonan comes back with another guy his muscle who's uh, you know apparently like tom noonan's got some information he reveals while he's there that he had died and come you know while he was there he made a deal with the devil or something to bring danny aiello down with them and stuff and so they're watching the clock it's like the summation of this episode is one of the dopiest of all time but it, it holds up so it hits midnight on the clock which it goes off throughout the entire episode it's always hitting the hour and you hear when it's the hour and stuff and danny aiello is still alive and mm. tom noonan you know it was just like he can't be and, and suddenly him and his buddy who was there with him presumably his guardian demon or whatever mm-hmm. disappear 
Danny Aiello has got this little buddy of his, uh, who, you know, takes numbers down for him and stuff. And he's like, how'd you do it? How he knew all every time. And he's like, look, I didn't know he's gone. You know, I knew he was getting his information from the other side, but like I used my head instead. I just set the clock back 10 minutes. So, you know, he's like, but if that's the case, you know, and he's like, can you go get me a drink or something like that? And then you hear the real clock hit midnight and, you know, he brings the drink to Daniela and Daniela is dead in the booth. Oh my God. Such a great fucking episode, but they did cool episodes like that. Mm -hmm. And the twilight zone, the eighties reboot did cool episodes like that. Dude, I love the one with, it's the mom from Christmas story. And she could pause time. Yes, Melinda and, Dillon. And then it was it was like during the Cold War. So there oh, had, I remember that episode. It had to be an episode about you know us getting blown up. Remember the ending? Yeah, it's the missiles like a centimeter from the ground, and she pauses time, and she can't unpause time oh. because oh, yeah. she will cause nuclear fallout. So, so she's stuck by herself with it's, time it's, paused, and she can't. Yeah, you know, the it's I remember that shot, man. She steps out. Like it's the, the, she's having the worst day of all time. Mm-hmm. She finds out she can stop time and blah, blah, blah. And then there's like suddenly nuclear war. It was in the eighties. So there was always like Russia's on the verge of dropping the bomb. And there's this growing cacophony. There's noise coming from everywhere. The kids fucking her husband, the world, the news. And she's like, stop. And then everything goes quiet. And then she steps outside and, and everything's still. And you see the fucking missile. It's just so close to the ground. God, I remember that. It's so, so, so good. Um, all right, man. I don't know how we got on that shit. Sorry mm-hmm. about that. Sorry about Back to the sound. Now, in the video that I've always seen, the Oilers video, disappointed mm-hmm. faces of your peers is awesome because it's just Gretzky scoring on people right, left and right. right, right, right. <laughs> so it's totally appropriate. Mm-hmm. What did, What was it in this instance? Well, the first part talks about fear, which was like a big thing to break through on this record emotionally, personally, I think for all of us, you know, um, I think a lot of the record is about overcoming fear and then disappointed face of your peers was just kind of like, I guess kind of how it felt coming up. Um, we just, we didn't feel a lot of love, you know, there wasn't a shit ton of support. It didn't, it, it just, we just felt like we're on our own Island. Yeah. It was competitive too. Yeah. Like we had very few friends and a lot of people just like, you know, watching from afar being like, you know, what's this all about? You, you know? guys shouldn't have hung out. Did you, did, well, you, I guess you didn't hang out with band people. Not much. Not a whole lot. So, and so, all right. So you're not going to get any love from fellow bands because mm-hmm. you're all gang like and, and click like mm-hmm. and stuff. Um, and you're not going to get any love from, um, I guess what, what would be the next organization? Where would you hang out with? Or who could, when just you're a band, with each other. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess you're, you're are an island yeah. at that point. Yeah. yeah. But is it being a self-imposed island or is a it? A little bit. I think, well, a little bit of both, you know, because we kind of, we came out and we're really like headstrong and we we're very like, uh, almost anti-rock and roll in a lot of ways, you know, we like just kind of the way we acted and behaved and stuff like that. And we had our own kind of like code of ethics, I guess. And that was very un-rock and roll to have. So we didn't gel well. What was the code of ethics meaning like? I think it was more just like respect women, don't treat anybody like garbage, you know. Um, and that was relatively new or just in the world just, you were dealing in with? In the world of rock and roll, like it was still just like largely sexist and homophobic. And those are th- those two main things were were still like pretty raging. Right, know? right, right. <laughs> um, and we were opposed to those things. So. so at that point, it's like, well, I can't really hang out with the band if they're just going to like do what? Yeah, and yeah. It, well, like I also found stuff. it really boring. Like you know, you'd hang out with bands, and then you would come to find out, like, oh, all they do is party, and then you would just get, you know, like they wouldn't go see anything cool or have a good experience or find something interesting. It was just like, oh, we're just gonna get fucked up. Like that's boring. Right. You gotta kind of dodge, old. yeah, dodge yeah. the destructive behavior type stuff. You know. Mm-hmm. God, it's so like, I was not into drinking when I was in high school. Mm. I mean, I was never, I still am not to this day. It's just booze. Not, you know, obviously I like sugar more than anything else. Mm. But, and weed came later on. But the, uh, I was so, I, I would never go like, I was straight edge, but I just didn't right. have a taste. But there's a place in high school where it's just like you went out and partied and at like uh, Snake Lake or down or up in Iron City or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, where we grew up, but, but even then I was like, I hate this. I was like, can't we like, we'd go stand out in the woods around a keg right? that like we labored for five hours to get, <laughs> uh, had instant friends because of it, but nobody wanted to fucking hang out with all of right. them, mostly intimidating and scary. 
And then the whole time I'm like, you know what was fun when we used to just send pizzas to people? Let's go do that. <laughs> and there was nobody wanted to do that anymore. General you know? mischief. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You're gonna dopey shit like that. Let's sit around and watch TV. Let's play even like let's play Atari back in the days. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, there's a shift to like this is a rite of passage, I guess. This is what adults do or something. Right. And there was a lot of forced drinking, which the moment I got out of high school, I was so delighted it was I was past that. Right. Because when you're hanging out with a bunch of people who are like, that's all they're doing. You have no fucking choice but mm -hmm. to go along. And as much as you sit there going, no, let's go home and prank call. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get any fucking love there. Mm -hmm. So getting out of high school, I was so delighted to be free of the like i mean it sounds stupid but the crushing fucking burden right. of like it's friday mm -hmm. yeah we have to fucking party mm -hmm. we I have to we find would, a beer we would, ball we would hang out same kind of thing with the with the keg in the field but we were at a, a golf course usually yeah. <laughs> golf course yeah. and you're sitting there going like why are we here right like we could be any place man i'd rather be inside and and cats stop wanting to go to the movies and shit mm -hmm. like if there were big movies like you know fucking indiana jones or something they'd be like oh let's all go to the movies but yeah. i remember like I mean, it sounds stupid, Ben. I was like, let me see, maybe 12, but couldn't get anybody to go see Gandhi with me <laughs> <laughs> when it came out. <laughs> and later in life, that got even harder, man. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you can't sell movies like that to to people who are just like, dude, we just want to get drunk. Right, right. Which was so fucking boring. Mm -hmm. So what did you guys do then? You're done with your set. Because that's the thing you hear over and over again. There's no, it's not like, oh my God, there were chicks galore. You guys were pretty much homebodies i think we were usually so tired that we would just kind of go to sleep i think I mean, we, yeah it came in handy later in you know like recent touring where we're just shot when we're done right so we're like you know we're all getting older so we get winded a little bit quicker <laughs> yeah. like man we just want to chill afterwards yeah do you play video games yeah or? i play video mm -hmm. games hang out a little bit with each other watch a movie that kind of stuff stop at walmart that's a big thing to do is it really that's jason that's muse does that when we're touring really? on podcasts he lives like we can't get very far <laughs> because you'll be driving and he's like clovis pull over and then you realize that <laughs> there's a walmart and you're like dude we just stopped at the walmart he's like but they have different shit here <laughs> whoa well, he'll stop at multiple walmart <laughs> along the way dude we have oh, we've been <laughs> late for a gig and we almost missed a gig what is he looking for i don't know what are we all looking for <laughs> at walmart he's looking for something there's some insatiable need in him mm -hmm. that he feels he's going to step into one of these places and he's going to have this this walmart over the last one will have that thing like a perfect example he'll be driving and he'll be like i need a little fan and you're like we have little fans that hang from the box he's like but i need one that i could kind of bring it with me he needs he can't sleep without like this the white noise of a fan mm -hmm. yeah, i'm the same way uh I need, I need some kind of noise or i freak out because i start to focus in on the silence and it drives me nuts but he just loves to shop and pick up fucking dvds what do you guys go when you go yeah, like dvds and yeah he goes to the toy aisle you see what kind DVDs. of star wars action figures they oh, have and then, same shit. and then, and then weird yeah. regional shirts you know we were in Utah a couple of weeks ago, and like there was just these this amazing shirt that was just a giant bear ripping. It was like a real photo of a giant bear like ripping a fish out of the water and like biting <laughs> yeah. it. Utah, on it. and like yeah, it was just it was just you know they probably don't sell that anywhere around here. So it's like you know there's just <laughs> Bakersfield. Yeah. So I guess he's got a point. Like you know there's different. There there's might different be regional stuff. shit. We're basically we would we would be limited to one Walmart trip per week basically in a weird because they would take up so much time when we would go too we would like it would have to be on a night of a short drive and then we crap we'd, we'd, we'd pick like uh we'd pick like a crappy movie series and we're like all right we need to get all of these right and we're gonna watch them <laughs> like all. friday the 13th yeah we do something like that yeah and like we're gonna yeah. watch all of them now yeah did you like and do you still like driving around on the bus and shit like that i do yeah i really like it it's, it's therapeutic cool it. yeah, yeah it's fun really oh. and you guys can just like go chill in your own quarters you don't it's not all forced activity like let's fucking stare at each other and no fucking talk. you can if, yeah. if, if you want to you can but like you know you can go in your bunk and just shut everything off if you want and when you go on a tour it's multiple buses correct um depending yeah depending, yeah, depending. on the tour and how much crew you have and how much production you're rolling but the with. band stays pretty much on one bus yeah well we we, we mix a little bit yeah sometimes we have two band buses sometimes yeah and split it up band it depends crew. if like people are bringing you know wives and yeah. dogs and stuff out oh my god that's right man yeah that and that wasn't a part in the beginning the beginning yeah that was, that was a non-issue mm -hmm. when was the first time you realized like oh i'm bringing but your lady plays in, in a band yeah as well, she's right? a mindless self-indulgence she plays bass she'd be doing it longer than me that's right yeah so she's she's no stranger to that. Well, all right, there's one thing she does in her band. It's one thing you do in your mm. band. But then one day it's like, hey, there's a third one. Like we got a kid. Yeah. How's that? What's the balance? The you know one one of us 
always has to be home, you know, obviously. Well, we haven't braved, like, bringing her out on a tour yet. We really? That would be like, you know, but now she's starting preschool, so it's kind of tough. It's yeah, because totally. she's landed. Yeah, she's in so the, now, in the school. I, you know, it'd be weird to bring her out on a tour. I think she would lose her mind, too. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, I think she would, you would be stopping fun. at a lot more Walmart. Yeah, 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 yeah. It would yeah. be one a week, man. Yeah, but that's how it works. So, like, one of us will be on tour and one of us will be home. Yeah. Um, did you think that you would get involved with somebody or marry somebody in music? I didn't. Yeah. Who do you think it was going to be actually, like a normie? I didn't, I didn't know actually. I, I didn't think about it too much. I actually didn't think I was going to get married. What you, you just know? thought you'd morse it up the whole year? Yeah, life. I did. I did. I really did. <laughs> I thought the, I was going to morse it up. Code of silence. Yeah. <laughs> is, is, is he, I yeah. had a couple years here and there of code of silence for sure. What's code of silence? Just kind of like safe your straighter gay, you or know, just like not going near anybody. Just like nope, certain artists. Not, Why certain, is that? Not even going to date anybody. Just having a bad experience. You know what I mean? Just, yeah. So I like a bad girl could ruin, ruin <laughs> really stuff for you for a long like, time. Yeah. Fuck it. You just get sour at the world for a while. Yeah. I don't know, man. I mean, maybe it's maybe you guys were thin boys, so you had options. But mm. a fat boy, he don't get sour at the world, <laughs> man. He's just like that didn't work out. Tell me what I'll change. I will change for you. <laughs> Um, really? So that, and what is that called? No. What is it? What'd you call it? You just coined it. What would you call it, Mikey? Code of silence? Code of silence. <laughs> what is it? No, I'm still going to make it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Code, Code of silence. Code of silence. Um, that's too funny. So, and so during that period, people were like, oh, he might not marry anybody. And shit. Yeah, 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 for sure. I didn't think I was going to get married. Um, and where did you meet her on tour? On, on, well, we actually met, uh, we met when we, we had opened. We had opened up for her band when we were a baby band because she loved our band. And we opened up for Miles Self Indulgence at Irving Plaza. And that's actually when we met. And where's Irving Plaza? Um, that's in New York City. Right. Yeah. 14th Street. Yeah. It's Is it a big Irving place? Plaza. It's by Union Square. Yeah. It's a theater. It's a pretty big theater. It's, it's like 1,500 people. Yeah. Yeah. Right yeah. Really great. They were doing like something like a fucking week there or something. You and know? you guys opened for them one mm -hmm. night and you're mm -hmm. still a baby band. Yeah. Yeah. And then. We kind of lost touch for a bit and then, you know, but we both really liked each other when we first met, but we lost touch and then we saw each other on Project Revolution Tour, which is like years later on the Lincoln Park Tour and then we just hit it off again. Really? Yeah. So how many years is years later? Um, From opening up to them to Project Rev is five years. Five years. Oh. Five, what, so years. you were code of silencing it when you first met her or something? When, right when I, I just got, I just got, um, out of a relationship and I was definitely in code of silence mode <laughs> when I first, when I first, um, when I first re-met her, right. you know, I was like, but I just, it, it, you know, I just liked her so much that it was like. And how do like people in music date? Uh, we would, you would have to find things to do. It was actually really fun. Like, cause you know, you would be on this big tour that was at, uh, where was it? At Sheds, you know? which are amphitheaters and they're outside, they're semi outside, you know, and you just have tracks and tracks of land that you go get lost in. So we would actually just kind of like have to kind of sneak out of away the, from the crowds. Yeah, we might be would, like, it's fucking him and yeah, her. We would, we would get off. I would get off stage cause she had been done earlier and then we'd meet up after I was done. And then we would literally kind of sneak out. It was awesome. Like we would have to, we would go like, you know, around fences and like, all right. Just, now if you have to pick a pop song to score this, <laughs> What is it? I don't know. Oh man. Oh, what were we? Well, Umbrella was really big at the time <laughs> <laughs> by Rihanna, and that's what we love that song. <laughs> we love Umbrella. Um, umbrella. So when you guys are sneaking away under the yeah, fence and the yeah. crowd is looking this way, yeah. it's Umbrella Ella, 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 as you guys said in yeah. the field. Uh, where are you during this? You know what? I wasn't. I wasn't on the Project Revolution tour. So what is he? You just hearing back from him? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of hanging out with him. Called me up. Well, no, he um he told me that they started you know hanging out and they were getting along and I was like you know I remember I remember meeting her back in the day. They were all super cool. Like we hit it off immediately with that yeah, band. Yeah, we hit it off with her. And I I was a mega fan yeah. of her band too. And they so they were in existence before you guys were. Mm -hmm. yeah, a, yeah. A band? I remember you were in college when you got the first Mindless mm -hmm. CD, and I remember John loved them. And, yeah, we loved them. You know. How weird, man, that you listen to their music and then one day you wind up and marry the it's chick. It's super weird. It's super weird. It's like the universe. Uh, that, 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 those are the moments where the universe folds. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, <sighs> they folding space yeah. there. Dune style. Yeah. Those are um, cool. Those are cool. All right, we jump back in. Okay. Now 
Now, when you get into okay. this part, uh -huh. the do or die, what would you call this? The chant? We or call the... it the orphan section. Why do you call it that? <laughs> because I, I had envisioned this army of orphans. Like, like singing really, this part. Yeah. Like just like dirty faces and like, <laughs> you know, just, I, I can't even. Yeah. I would just, I just was like, no, this is like, we were laughing about it, me and Doug. And like, we actually did this thing, which ended up, we, were, we ended up removing it where I sang a bunch of these and we pitch shifted them to sound like children and they were all in there and it was too much. It was too ridiculous. We had to pull it all out. And like, what would you have done live? Just like, uh, we won't be doing that. Or would you have to bring in a children's choir each time you perform yeah, that Yeah, something part? like that. The first time we did it, we did have kids. We really? Little kids. It was the scariest thing ever. Why? We did it on top of Rockefeller Plaza and we had never really played the song because we just recorded it. And that's the most we played it. We'd only were... We were hurt. We never played it live. And the song, as you can hear, is super intricate. I think Chris Lord Algy, who mixed it, he said it held the record for most tracks he'd ever mixed in a song. It was like 167 tracks. To and, put it together. Yeah. And to have to play that on top of a building live. What was VMAs, this for? It was for VMAs. What year is this? Um, right when the record came out. So was that 2006, I guess? I think it was the opening... But like now the opening is there was like a pre-show and we right. had to play live and it was so nerve wracking. Did like, did you land it though? I don't know. <laughs> I <laughs> it, it felt really good, but it was like, you know, things on TV. The thing about TV is like whenever I hear a TV performance that sounds great, I'm always blown away because sounding good on TV is really hard. You know, like it's a mixing issues and they usually just mix vocal up and they mix, you know, and, and we were really nervous. And I mean, I think we, we definitely nailed it, but I definitely think there was a lot of people after they had seen that going like, what, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> Cause it was this really elaborate song with like 10 sections and, and they didn't cut it down. They're like, play the whole fucking mm -hmm. thing. I and mean, that's the first time. Had they heard it before? No, nobody had heard it either. How did they, how did it get received? It was received, especially when the track, leaked a couple of days later uh -huh. it was received really well like once it, it was an immediate response to. and did it really leak or was it quote unquote leaked i think because in these days nothing is it, it seems nothing i think is it, i think leaked. it was a leak and i can't remember but i'm actually glad it did happen so people could hear the song and be like oh i get it <laughs> do you watch it back like when you're done doing the mtv thing you're like oh let's watch it i don't watch anything really i get really like when it comes on, I get really weird and I like kind of start looking at it. Like I keep tilting my head back <laughs> so that way my eyes can't see it to the point where my head's just all the way back. And You're just, just looking up at the ceiling. Yeah. And I don't want to watch it. I don't what is it? it? Is it represents the, the other, do you see yourself still in it or that's you're like, the that's problem. the other guy. Yeah. I don't see myself in that. Is it and a Bruce Banner Hulk thing? Yeah. A little bit. Like I, I don't see myself in that person. So I, I just, it freaks me out. And, I, and, and also I like living in the moment. I don't take a lot of photographs or anything. Really? I just kind of like, I saw it. I How old's your kid? She's, I take a lot of photos of her. I was going to say, that'll fucking change. Yeah, me. exactly. But that's it. Right. Like, I don't, I don't take a lot of photos. And even some moments with her, like, let's say it's her birthday or something. Like, I'll take photos. And then after about a couple minutes, I'll stop. George know? Carlin used to talk about that. I think he, he did a piece, like a little comedic bit about like, what the fuck do we need to take a picture so quick for it just fucking happened. Right. Right. Like, whatever happened to remember and shit. <laughs> um, and I guess that's true, man. Like there is a school of thought. And why, why do you think that is? Because don't you don't need, you don't look back at it. Like you won't take pictures or whatever. Cause you're like, I'm here and it's not there and it's not in front. I of like, me. I like remembering it. And I think I like, yeah, I always like remembering it. I think it, What's ever been burned into your soul at that point is much better than a photograph. Oh, know? so true. You know, so but I got him, so don't worry. Yeah, he, I yeah, he takes I all the pictures. pictures. He takes it helps got, that back up. Backup, yeah. What a rebel you are. Like, I don't need no pictures. Because <laughs> Mikey takes them. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, though? Like, I, I, can, I can totally hear where he's coming from because there's moments that, not really, you know, I don't have a kid or anything, but there's moments where I'm like, wow, I didn't take a picture of that, you know? Yeah, I just don't even think about I it. I literally believe that you don't have a kid. Like, any other rock and roll person, I'd be like, yeah, now that you know of. But you two <laughs> boys are so fucking adorably straight. <laughs> Straight-laced and so, but like, <laughs> uh, we got ethics. We got morals. <laughs> I, I believe you. I'm like, yeah, but you don't. <laughs> um, the uh, We were talking about, well, uh, Mikey went and took a leak. The... Uh, the performance on the rooftop at where? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, but I remember while I was walking away, I, I was like, man, I 
Like you're talking about the orphan chorus. Yeah, yeah. Like I want to hear that version. Oh, uh, with the orphans? Yeah, like this is the orphan. We used to write orphan section, remember? That's what we used to write. <laughs> the orphan. The, the anticipation. Yeah. But did you have kids for that performance or no? Yeah, we did. The one on the, the roof. We're yeah, on the roof. We had kids. And they were like in skeleton makeup. They looked scared. You yeah, were on the top of. <laughs> we're on the top of the NBC building, right? Yeah, Rockefeller Rock, Center. Rock. What part did they sing? This orphan part coming up, but then we all sang it, I think. But they sang this orphan. Part. Right. So was, the do yeah. or die. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they, so they had to teach these kids this. And yeah, like, they, get up uh, on a fucking roof. Yeah, yeah. They wear the <laughs> skeleton costume. <laughs> You're gonna die tonight, yeah, children. Stand up. Um. Oh, good lord, man. Did they pull it off? Yeah, I think so. I think so. it's a hard. That was a hard gig because yeah. also there's like there's probably twenty seven of me right there doing it too. There's only three of them. So. Is that what it is? It's you piled on top of you, yeah, on top of you, this, on top of you. Yeah, this is just piles of vocals. And do you, is it the same other people like, vocal, or do you have to do it and then I'll sing it again and I'll sing it again and that's what the twenty six? You do like different are. harmonies and stuff. Yeah, you'll yeah. sing it again and you'll sing it because you don't it's want like them slightly to be, different. Yeah, slightly different, and you don't want them to match up because then it won't sound real, won't sound like a gang of people. This may even be like some of the other guys in the band. I can't remember when we did this, but it might have been another real late one, so it might have been like just me doing it like 30 times. Never thought about that, but it is probably like a bunch. Your voice rings out right on top, yeah. so it just feels like you're just powering right, at this right. point. But I guess we'll hear it in a sec. Come on, dude. The world will never take my heart. Like, yeah. That's that's beautiful, man. That's okay. Shakespearean. That's where did that come? The moment do you remember writing that? Like the this orphan part? Did it all come in one big rush? I think it was the same night that I did the opening. Like I remember working on this song for hours and I remember not stopping until I finished kind of the bulk of what my ideas were. And um yeah, they all just kind of poured out really fast. It's yeah. so, it's, it's such like, it's when you hear it, you're like, how come every song doesn't end with a fucking chant and a, and a, a litany of what you stand for? You know right, what I'm saying? Right, it's right. so goddamn powerful. I'm unashamed yeah, to show, show my scars. scars. Come on, man. Yeah, it's pretty on its sleeve, this one. Oh, <laughs> yeah, but like that's, but you earn it. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, because the sh song's daring. You've already crammed a bunch of different songs into one song. <laughs> mm -hmm. You're already, you're already shot the moon at this point. Mm -hmm. So I think you more than earn the lyrics, the, the heart <laughs> on the sleeve lyrics, because yeah, yeah. it's like, what makes it special is nobody does this. Mm -hmm. Like that's why it it rises right to the top. That's why it's so powerful, mm -hmm. and that's why like I can replay this until the dad done. God willing, when I'm in the box, I'll be like, play this fucking song. <laughs> but it it's it's so real while being you know unreal right. at the same time. Right. It's about something. That's a good way to put it. It's about being real and unreal at the same time. It's the most important, least important thing in the world. Right. Like as you're listening to it, you're like, oh my God, this is we've all got to band together and stop whatever it is he's fucking <laughs> singing about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Here we go. Do it. Just yeah, a just man. And I'm not a hero. Just a boy who yeah, wants to sing, sing this, this song. song. Come on, it's adorable. And yeah, it's, it's and again, heart on the fucking sleeve. Heart on the sleeve. A little, little dash of I don't give a fuck on top. Just a little <laughs> Yeah, and with even though it even though it does have a Susan, if you will, of I don't give a fuck, it's still uh, well the, yeah, I think the big I don't give a fuck is coming up, but it yeah. reeks of caring beyond right. caring. Right. And that's kind of the duality of the person in their twenties, which right. is like I don't give a shit, but you give nothing but a shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the problem is like you give a shit about everything. And so <laughs> yeah. if you want to throw it off, you can. But it then it, it builds into this amazing fucking crescendo, which happens right now. Dude crushes on drums. Like the yeah. drum is drums are phenomenal. He mm -hmm. killed it. He killed it. Did he play also the snares and shit, the bandy stuff or the marching? Yeah, band up stuff? until like he did uh that stuff that was done in studio and then we had um we had a whole day at Capitol Records where we did strings and 
we had marching band stuff there. So there was another layer that went on top. So there's his playing of the snare and the drums. And then there was the later, another additional, basically marching band in at Capitol Records where we put a marching band on it more or less. That's now, where we did the Liza Minnelli section? Yes. So What's the Liza Minnelli section? In Mama, she, she does one section of Mama at the end, Liza Minnelli. And we did this live session via satellite where she's in New York and we're in LA and she sang onto the track and it was so amazing what was that about why why liza minnelli just really wanted liza minnelli of all the people no wonder people and what was the code what was again code of silence code of silence yeah. <laughs> and one of those code of silence like put liza minnelli on them but why she's her got, she's got that zazz you know she yeah totally yeah, she's amazing but like for what 25 26 27 year old is like i know let's get liza minnelli i know well, i was watching um oh, that movie it's cabaret right? cabaret Cabaret right. was a really big... Yeah, our grandmother was a big... Of yeah, course, yes. Cabaret movie. would yeah. be... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cabaret was, like, kind of a big influence, you know, a bit visually, too, on this whole thing. Right. And I was watching it while we were while we were doing the record, and I was like, oh, she has to be... We just get fucking Liza Minnelli. Let's just Oh, I, I remember it was... It was like, man, we got to get someone... It's kind of like Liza Minnelli. And then I remember Rob, Rob being like, why don't we just get Liza Minnelli? <laughs> right. <laughs> And then he picked up his phone and called her 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 publicist. I think it was like, "Hey, would would Liza do this?" And that was it. And it just happened. That's simple. Super cool. You have to talk her through it and stuff. Like, we're not looking much. For this. She we're was so she's a pro. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. She just nailed it right away. And she even added stuff like where she's like crying at the end. She's like weeping. She just started weeping. It's now awesome. that was you did it from an ISDN line. You were in a different place. Yeah, we were was. in LA at Capital, and she was. Uh, she was in New York. Did you ever see her after that? Yeah, yeah. She came and hung yeah, out. Hang, yeah, yeah. We had. I got me and Lynn's got to have dinner with her. Did she ever sing it with you guys? She was no. supposed to once or twice, like and on then stage it, or we something? couldn't get it. We couldn't get the timing right. When we did MSG, I wanted her to have her come do it, and we just couldn't get our shit together in time. What so happens then when you play that part? Do you bring in a recording? I, I sing it. You sing yeah, it. I just sing her part. Yeah. All little tricks of the trade. Mm -hmm. Um, that is uh I wouldn't be if 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 that was me, if this was my story, mm -hmm. my mother would have a heart attack at that, that point. Where mm -hmm. it's just like I just uh, we're brought put Liza Minnelli on the track. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I remember I remember our mom freaking out. Yeah. It's kind of yeah, that's a but but to be fair, like she's very I mean, yeah, of course our mothers would be like Liza Minnelli, but she rocks, man. Yeah, she like does. even she's if you awesome. if you don't know her from her previous work, like she's amazing in Arthur. Perhaps right. one of yes. the best romantic so comedies ever Oscar. made. Did and she you, win an Oscar for that? I don't know if she did. I, don't, I think she might have gotten nominated, okay. but I don't know if she. I can't remember. I don't think so. She won I think Ar John won Gielgud won that thing. year yeah. for playing Hobson, but um, in 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 Arthur. But she is like the woman that you spent most. At least I did. Spent most of my life looking for based on a movie I saw when I was a kid. Right. Like that was who you wanted to marry, Linda Marola. She was so real, mm -hmm. and there's nothing inauthentic about her. But a lot of cats probably know her now from Arrested Development. Right. She's fucking fantastic she in is. Arrested Development. She is. She's the nicest, sweetest person. And we did an interview for Interview Magazine where she interviewed me for it. And that's the first time we spoke after this. Right. And then um, and then we just hung out. We got to hang out like one or two times. It was really awesome. She came and saw us in New York mm. on that last tour. Who yeah. else have you met that you were like, it was cool to hang out with that person? Well, we ended up becoming like really great friends with Grant and Kristen Morrison. So... Grant Morrison is Grant like, Morrison, yeah, 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 Morrison, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so he's he's now like one of our friends. So like, like real cool, cool stuff. How do you like fucking? It's tough to understand him, man. I have no problem. Really? Yeah. You you no register problem. Scottish that quickly? Totally, totally. Yeah, I totally. I've, I've, you as I've well? decoded it. Yeah. I have to stare at him when he speaks, like right into his mouth, and then I'm always about two <laughs> seconds behind. And I go, yes, yes, girl. like I'll be able to answer. <laughs> yeah, the question. No, we totally, totally. I picked up all the slang. Like I yeah, know, we're, I know we're a half Scottish too. Yeah. I don't know if there's anything to do with it. That's like knowing a, a living genius. Yeah, it's like knowing a genius. It's really you never think you're gonna really meet too many geniuses or any, and you meet him, and you're like, oh, this is what meeting a genius is like. He he was writing Batman, of course, for a while, and he mm -hmm. wrote this line for Batman for um the uh, you remember Batmite. Yes. Uh, every Batman writer in the 90s to the 2000s just like get it out of the continuity. Mm -hmm. It's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. You know, Batmite is an interdimensional <laughs> imp or something like that who's a massive fan of Batman <laughs> um, who always winds up bumbling and fucking not helping Batman out. It's like left over from the late 50s, early 60s, I believe. But um, Grant Morrison, of course, you know, is not content to leave the past. Be the past. He's like, look, I grew up on all these fucking stories. Mm -hmm. Multicolored Batman, the Batman of composite Batman, composite Batman, yeah. Batman from Orange Star, whatever it was called. He's like, I, I want to bring all that. I'll make it work. Don't worry, I'll mm -hmm. make it work. And he does make it work. But he brought um, Batmite back. To, yeah. Like talk to Batman at one point. Batman, you know, was kind of 
he's broken going at crazy, this point. He's right? going crazy, yeah, yeah. especially because he's seeing Batman. And they kept telling us, they're like, don't worry, man, it's real. This isn't else worlds. Like, this is working. Like, you'll see Batman works. And it was so wonderful. He has this really great line where, you know, he's trying to help Batman figure something out or Batman figures out. He's just about to leave him. And he's Batman is from the was it eighth ninth dimension mm-hmm. something like mr mixel yeah they hang something. out together here mr mix mr mix right? click and um he said like uh something to the batman they asked him i can't remember exactly i gotta memorize it because i loved it but he asks him something about like what is it and 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 batmite says don't you get it batman the eighth, the ninth dimension whatever the dimension it is mm-hmm. is imagination and then fucking disappears oh, such a beautiful yeah. fucking sentiment and suddenly took a dopey character yeah, yeah. i remember when this came out he was so psyched about it i remember him giving it to us he it g- was like i put batmite in it I, I, because yeah, that's huge yeah, and to make it yeah, work it's yeah. one thing to throw in Batmite to that next level to yeah. the next level where you made him like a, a yoda for that moment yeah, yeah you know yeah. what i'm saying oh mm-hmm. so beautiful all right back into the, the other beautiful mm-hmm. right here And you repeat again. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a repeat. And then, yeah, we bring back the orphan section. And this is kind of like, I think, yeah, this section kind of has everything in it. Uh, yeah, so basically yeah. you're re- revisiting every piece of the song yeah. we've kind of heard. And yeah, that's fully dialed up to, to do, 11. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Any theme that we touched on anywhere in the songs appears in the ending. Yeah. It's so beautiful. The combination works like mad. I can see you haven't hit those notes. That's a hard one. Yeah, the, you didn't think about that when you were putting it together. No. <laughs> Next time you're in the studio, you're like carry on, carry <laughs> yeah. some way down here. <laughs> went on really long at one point too the snare at the end i think it used to go on longer i you could easily have made this song like especially with how big it is you could have made it like a 10 minute yeah song yeah you could have like kept going and stuff but it is perfect there's nothing it's not like there ain't nothing wrong with this song this is one for my money i've been alive 42 years one of the five best songs ever written it's amazing it does so many great fucking things that music does it's it's it sounds like freedom and hope and Mm -hmm. while still dealing with real emotions like you know doubt and Mm -hmm. negativity and fear oh it's just such a beautiful work of art man in everything you've done where does this song rank i mean you know it does kind of rank as like it's gotta be big right? yeah yeah it does rank as the song it's almost like you were saying, like, after this sentiment was created, you know, I kind of felt like I don't have to do that again. I don't want to do that again. Like it's, but it's because, it, because it's such, it's the largest sentiment, I think, lar- you know, most grandiose sentiment I think I'll ever be a part of in right. terms of, you know, just, just based off age and interest at this point, you know, I, I don't know that grandiose is what I'm going for anymore. Maybe even when I'm 50, but not now. What is it now? What do you feel like now? Intimacy, quiet? <clears throat> um, Not so much quiet. I think a little more noise, a little more abstraction, um, minimalism, you know, I think. And what I'm trying to, I don't, I don't even know like where I'm at in terms of what I'm trying to say either. It's a bit different though. It's definitely different. It's got to be weird, like, again, we talked about it in the last episode, but it's weird getting to a place where everyone's like, ah, we know you for this. This is what you do. Right. And then you're like, yeah, well, thank you, and that's what got me here. But, like, that was what I did, and now I might be interested in doing something else and stuff. And that's where, like, the good stuff comes from when you start playing with another tool. This this is a perfect example. This was you going, like, let's shatter and rebuild to some degree. Yeah. And look what happened with it. Yeah, totally um what you got in it? we'll all right we, we talked to the to death about this we'll jump into something real quick mm-hmm. favorite movie of all time oh man i gotta say empire strikes back really still to this day I, yeah i mean it's 
it's probably gradually changing. All right, give me a minute. You go. I think. It, <laughs> I think. I think I talked about mine last time. Jaws. Yes, we did Jaws talk was my about favorite Jaws, movie of all time, man. and it still holds. Is that still holds? Yeah. What's in your top like five? Oh, top what do you five. Watch all right. Um, I'm not looking for mine. I'm not we got fishing. we got Jaws. We got Dawn of the Dead, the '78 one. Oh my god, I love that that's movie. one of my favorites. Um, it's the movie that made you think like I would love to live in the mall. Yes, yes. This ain't bad. Like this dystopian ver- vision of the future. Yeah, it was like soothing, right? Yeah, I was like, this ain't soothing. bad, man. You got you shop like crazy until those motorcycle kids came out. Oh yeah, Tom Savini and the gang. Yes. You think other faves? Uh, Empire Strikes Back. Did you guys watch that together as kids? Yeah, we had a VHS. That was the first VHS you got. Were you Star Wars kids? Did you have the toys? Totally, yeah. Did you really? Huge Star Wars kids. Yeah. Um, The what was the biggest vehicle you had? Well, you said you got Slave One when you got the guitar. Yeah. Trying to think. We had the Adat. Adat, and I. You had the. He had the fucking speeder bike. I had the ride on speeder bike that 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 the one that a kid could get on. Yeah, my my dad like he like talked some dude into selling it to him. I mean, (laughs) I think what he did was. He he talked the guy into selling him the display that said you could win this bike. That yeah, wasn't that was the bike we were gonna win. They were gonna send you one. Right. Mm-hmm. So my dad had somehow talked the guy at Toys R Us. At that age, aren't you just like this is the best thing? I that didn't will ever even know happen. it existed. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I hit some kind of lottery, life yeah. lottery, you know? Um. Yeah, man. It's. I would imagine that would be a moment where it's just like, forget it. Nothing. Nothing will ever be as big as this. <laughs> yeah, my. You know, like my mom still talks about that. That that speeder bike. <laughs> you remember you got that she's, speeder bike. She still got it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. What about you? Um, Fisher King. Oh my god, such a good movie. Yeah. God, I haven't fucking thought about that movie in a long time. Every once in, and it's funny because it's so in my it's in my sad. top yeah favorite movies, but I don't think about it. But every two years, maybe. But it's still you know one of my favorites. What else? For those who've never seen it, man, it's this wonderful movie mm-hmm. uh, by Terry Gilliam mm-hmm. um, with a script by Richard Legravene. Zay. I don't know if you pronounce the last E. Um, but it's a story of a radio DJ and he's played by Jeff Bridges, um, who is kind of like a stern, like a shock mm-hmm, jock. Mm-hmm. And he, uh, you know, riles people up or whatever. And, um, he riled one dude up who then goes out with a shotgun and mm-hmm. blows away some people in a restaurant, you know, cause Jeff Bridges is like these rich people in their restaurants or whatever. Fuck. So this guy goes in with a shotgun and just levels the place, kills some people and whatnot. So Shock Jock loses his job and whatnot. And uh, on his way down and out, he runs into Robin Williams' character who's a homeless guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's a homeless guy full of whimsy, as, of course, only Robin Williams can be. <laughs> but this is Robin Williams before you get to Patch Adams and stuff. Like, this is kind of the first moment that Robin Williams kind of cements that role of, like, this is what I do. Mm-hmm. You know, whimsy and wonder with humor and stuff. Um he uh they become kind of uh, like jeff bridges realizes that like i got to get this dude back on his feet mm-hmm. like that'll help save me in some way but the connection that they have is the robin williams character had this young wife mm-hmm. like he was on his feet and a teacher or something like that I forget yeah what he did. yeah but he uh winds up you know he was out to dinner with his wife that night and when this guy came in with a shotgun his wife was one of the people that was killed and he went fucking nuts and mm-hmm. stuff like that wound up on the street so Jeff Bridges is about like, I got to save him. If I could just put him back on his feet, maybe I can fix myself in some way. It's a beautiful fucking movie. And uh, Terry Gilliam as the director brought to it some shit that wouldn't have been there um, with, I think, uh, another director, including like the vision of the the, the Black Knight or the Red Knight, yeah, whatever he yeah, is, yeah. the fiery knight mm-hmm. on top of the steed and stuff. <clears throat> it's a beautiful movie about heartbreak and loss and and uh redemption and and um it's not like mawkish redemption hollywood mm-hmm. redemption it feels very fucking real but it's incredibly sweet amanda palm a man not palmer amanda Plummer, right is in it i almost said amanda fucking palmer amanda uh Plummer's in it and she's so goddamn adorable also one of those like movie oh girlfriends. yeah real real intense character in that movie she plays real re- very real person <laughs> right? You know, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. Fire. One of yours. Clerks. Oh, yeah. Clerks. You know, one of my, it is. You're no, in my house, no, it absolutely way. is. It is fucking it's easily one of my, hands down. It's one of my favorites of all time. Mall rats as well. You guys are too sweet. I already wanted to adopt you. Clerks. Throw that in. The thing is, it's so identifiable. We were all clerks. So that's it changed the, the game, part. you know? Changed that's true, game. man. Yeah, it's it's it, in terms of if you worked at a fucking uh, at a bookstore and you yep, worked at yeah. a comic book store. Screamed us, you know? Totally. Yeah. I guess it would. Counterculture. It's tough yeah. to leave that behind, though, man. I always like I liked that. I liked the the um, outsider aspect. Yeah. 
And that's why I think I always gravitate toward it. Anytime shit gets too like, you're in the club now, I kind of tend to self-sabotage or like, mm. let me go do this or something like that. Because right. I love that feeling of, of I, I'm the, I don't know how else to explain it. I like being outside the norm. I don't right. know. I, I mean, which feels weird a lot when you're younger and whatnot. And I think the idea of most people tend to go for like acceptance and, and mass acceptance at that. And I still find it hard. I still, f I'd rather be like, I'd rather hang with who I consider the cool kids right. rather than like the mass. And that's something that I, I didn't get over. A lot of other people get over that. Uh, you guys get over it. You guys had to get over it because Jesus Christ, you met the masses. The masses came out to see you. Yeah, I mean, I guess in some ways we didn't get over it, though, because we wouldn't show up for stuff. Like, I mean, in terms of there was, you know, there's this kind of game that you can play, especially when your band gets kind of big. You can you can, you know, find a celebrity to date or show up to all these red carpet things. Or you can kind of show up to the to the circus, basically. Right. You know? And we just kind of never did it, you know. Yeah, but, yeah we avoided now that I think can, about though. it, you guys didn't really seen it up. Yeah, we didn't. We didn't at all. And I think we, because I think we didn't want to be accepted in that far, and we didn't because of that. I think that was a big part of, you know, probably a like a slight slip in commercial relevance. Definitely was connected to the fact that it's not being stupid in public does does commercial relevance even matter like once you sold as many albums as you guys did um it, no i mean it it's actually, like you're in for life at that yeah point, right? if you, you've made great work and you continue to great work make great work it, it doesn't and the work you made made a giant impact like i think you always have a you're always gonna be relevant to somebody and also it's kind of probably <clears throat> more difficult to do today what you guys did then because it's just a different it's a different world business and different yeah. world now yeah you could you can choose what you wanted to do back then right and now it's like the sahara so everybody's like they'll do any opportunity that's given because there aren't many opportunities in music so Ugh. we we were we were in a time where, where you can choose your battles and choose what you wanted to do you know and what do you do for the rest of your life more of the same or something different i think or you gotta keep i think you gotta keep finding <clears throat> the new even if it's really scary and risky and fucked up and makes people yell at you and, <laughs> and gets you in trouble. And I think you kind of always have to do it. I think if you, you know, something you had said when we first met, if you, if you end up on that treadmill and you just keep cranking it out, it's a, it's not a, it's not a, I don't think you'd be happy when you get old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Never taking the easy road is, yeah. well, you know, you think yeah. about it. It's like in the moment you're always like, shit, I got to think about what to do right now. What now? And you, tend to forget that one day you're going to have to look back mm -hmm. and what you want to see in your wake is shit that you love and stuff nothing everything you have your head you can keep your head up about it mm -hmm. like i don't think that's what i've tried i've tried my whole life career at least to just like every time i look back to be like i don't mind what i see like i'm not looking back because i'm running i'm just looking back to be like oh yeah that was cool that was cool what is it like for you you know over time now i can look back and i like, I appreciate everything we've done. Like, there's been, like, usually when we put out an album, like, I'll listen to it to death for the months that we're making it. And then the second it comes out, like, I kind of put it away. You know what I mean? Like, you I have kind of, to because you've been yeah. dealing with it for every frame of its life. Almost. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes I forget what the recorded versions of songs sound like. I'll, you know, like, I'll hear the recorded version. I'm like, oh, weird. You know, because I just don't listen to them anymore. Because you're so used to doing like live instead. Yeah, yeah. I try to get into the other. I don't want to get used to hearing it that way, you know. What do you want to do beyond the music at this point? Because, you know, you've got so much fucking yeah. life ahead of you. You've yeah, I mean. so much now. And now you're at a place where you're like, I want to do other shit as well. Yeah, I mean. There's, we heard there's, about you acting. Yeah, yeah. I just did that uh, the episode with G, the Aquabats. Um, that was fun. Uh, something I'd, I'd definitely do again. Um, I definitely want to write uh, like horror novels one day do you read horror novels? yes yes I so who do you Steve, read i love stephen king really yeah now so it, why what what's stopping you i mean i kind of like i haven't sat down and been like all right this is i'm writing this novel but exactly like i, sh I should be i should be doing that and but i have i write down ideas and all the time i write stuff like that down but as far as being like i'm writing a book right now i haven't started like yeah that is now going to come to bear yeah I have, to, for the first time. I have to unleash some of that ammo you know <laughs> What are you going to do besides the music? Besides MCR, what are you going to do? I don't know. Um, you know, I still make music all the time and I still like, I like exploring the dead music. mouse thing. What was that like? That was fun. That was really fun because it was, 
even though it was a world I knew nothing of, I had, I guess I knew where its roots were from. And I was a big fan of, you know, groups like Chemical Brothers right, and things like that. So I, I knew, I guess, where it had kind of come from. So to get an opportunity to work with a guy like that, who's basically on the cutting edge of the new of that was, was really amazing and super fun. He just, and it was cool because I just have, I, I have a lot of respect for him. Mm-hmm. He, he sent me a track. I said, well, what do you want? He says, I want what, whatever you're going to do. So just do it. And like, that's why I came to you. And then, you know, obviously we collaborated and stuff, you know, after we worked together and he was a, he was really headstrong. He knew what he wanted. He was really, and I just, you know, he's like that with every element, like building this stage to what it looks like, to which helmet he's going to wear to, and I, I really respected that. I saw a lot of us in him, you know, that's um, kind of neat. Yeah. Now, with that, will you ever do that live with him or no? I did it once uh, for iHeartRadio in Vegas. It was a radio show. Yeah, they just did that recently, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, I went and did it there. Super scary because we were both at different ends of the arena. I had never done it. It's a lot of words. <laughs> I, you know, I was really scared, and I had never not sung with a band. So to sing just to a track was really crazy. Right. You know, um, How did it come off? It came off, I think, great. Um, it's awesome to meet and hang out with other artists. This is the best fucking play date I've had <laughs> in my adult Thank years. You. A way date, Feelings if you mutual. Will. Feelings yeah, mutual. Seriously. Oh, I love the way boys. They're fantastic. I told my kid, I was like, look, I know they're married and stuff, but if their marriages don't work out, you have my permission to marry <laughs> one or both of the way boys. They're so good. Um, thanks for hanging out. Thank you, Thank first you. off, for making that song. Uh, making the whole fucking album, making all your music. But that song is absolute perfection and and it's it pushed me to do cool things like I, my hit miniseries i hit somebody i said in the intro um last time i didn't say it was a hit miniseries at that point but now it is um the song that i always hear whenever i write hit somebody before i start writing hit somebody the song that probably drove it the most was was this song oh, which awesome. is weird because it has nothing to do with hockey or anything like that but, but your first experience with it was and it lays yeah. onto it perfectly like you know it's it's this the way they do it in that video is basically you just watch that character's whole life it's it's so perfect like whoever put that video together knew the music knew the song mm-hmm. knew what it was about felt it and it was like oh i think it would work for this and it fucking does work mm-hmm. in space it's great art, man. And rarely do you get to thank great artists for their great art. So thank, thank you. you, boys. Oh, thank you. Excellent yeah. job. That'll be Smodcast for this week. I'm Kevin Smith. Gerard. Mikey. Have a week. This has been a production of Smodco Internet Radio. Sir, only at Smodcast.com. All your favorite Smodco shows aren't just available on audio anymore. All the best ones are now available as books. Podbooks.com. That's Podbooks with a Z. Transcribe directly from our Smarchives. Enjoy the Smonsters of Talk in print form. Kev, Ralph, Jay, Jen, Moj, and more. Just go to podbooks.com for more details. That's podbook with a Z on the end. Podbooks. Pods in print. Smodcast is turning six years old, motherfucker, and we're celebrating with a smorgy. January 26th and 27th, get ready for two days of non-stop aural pleasure in Halifax, Nova Scotia. The Smod Coast Morning Show, I Sell Comics, Highlands of Peephole History, Smodcast, The Secret Stash, Hollywood Babylon, Fat Man on Batman, Babylon Comic Con Theater, Plus One, Tell Em Steve Dave, Jay and Silent Bob Get Old, and a Smash Up Jam Session. The Smonsters of Talk invading the Spats Theater in Halifax, Nova Scotia, January 26th and 27th. Tickets just $99 for each day at smodcosmorgy.com. Don't miss the Smonsters of Talk as the Smods bring their pods to the Smorgy. Tickets available now at smodcosmorgy.com. Smodco's been blasting its own brand of fuck yeah for years in all forms of media. If you're saying, hold up sir dude, what about video games? 
but we got that market covered too. Visit Smarcade.com to learn about two, count them, two games for your iOS and Android device. Jay and Silent Bob grace your mobile with Too Fat to Fly and Let Us Dance. Get your game on, Smod Goblins. Check out Smarcade.com.